And this is May the 28th, Bernice Jackson interviewing Ralph Baker. Uh, Ralph, would you uh, tell me when and where you were born? I was born on my father's homestead, uh, a mile and a half west of Catesby. Go ahead. In uh, November the 4th of 1924. Uh, December? November the 4th. November the 4th. That Happens to be the same day as Will Rogers' birthday. Oh, well, <laughs> great people are born on. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and the year again. 1924. 1924. Okay. Now give me your parents' name. Uh. My father's name was uh, Frank Ralph Baker, and my mother's name was Fanny Gale Baker. What was her uh, maiden name? Graft. Graft. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you tell me something about your father? When was he born, and and uh, how come him to come to Catesby there? To well, he was born uh, in uh, North Missouri. Uh, February the 17th, 1880. Do you remember the town or? Uh, there's two or three little towns there and uh, near Chillicothe, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the name of the, of the little town. I might think of it after a while, but I can't remember it right now. And uh, <clears throat> when he was four years old, uh, his parents in uh, uh, a sister and brother moved to uh, uh, a farm four miles west of Harper, Kansas, and uh, he grew up there and uh, was trying to do some farming. And uh, oh, they uh, around 1900 they were having some droughts up there, and. Uh, Crops weren't doing too well, and, and uh, it did not look like they would be able to buy land there uh, because they couldn't raise the finances. And uh, sometime in October of 1901, Dad and uh, Uncle George and uh, their brother-in-law, uh, Reuben Haskins, and uh, their father, uh, Jasper Newton Baker came to Gage on the train and hired a locator to take him out to to uh, stake out three quarters land and the land happened to be uh, uh, a mile west of where Catesby was and dad's quarter was a mile and a half west the three quarters were joining and uh, they went back on the train back to Kansas and uh, February the 18th of 1902 they left there with uh, horses and covered wagons and so forth and some more of uh, the uh, aunts and uncles came along with them. We have a picture of them taken here in Woodward down here by the post office and anyway they left uh, grandfather's farm in uh, on the 18th of February, and the reason Dad remembers the, or thought he remembered the date was because it was the next day after his birthday. And uh, they uh, were a week coming down here. And uh, uh, I suppose, it's my understanding that you could not be away from your claim more than six months at a time, or someone would uh, try to jump your claim, or or some thing like that, so they had to uh, they had to get down here that spring. He broke out forty acres of land, and uh, <clears throat> they went back to Kansas for harvest that year, and uh, headed their wheat. And uh, I've heard this story a good many times. It made three bushels an acre, and. And he worked on a thrash machine for a while, and, and uh, when they came back in the summer, well, they brought some seed wheat back and sowed some wheat. Uh, he has told me a number of times about uh, 
uh, the year that he was 15 years old, the summer that he was 15, he worked a uh, hundred days on a thrash machine pitching wheat for a dollar a day. That would be in Kansas. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, west of Harper out there. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to jokingly say that the next year uh, a group of farmers went together and bought a company machine, they called it, and they wanted to hire some stout young fellows to pitch wheat and uh, uh, they agreed to pay him a dollar and a quarter a day, and uh, he uh, told me quite often about, uh, he said when the sun came up in the morning they were thrashing, and when the stars were shining at night they were still thrashing, and his words were that was the dearest damn quarter he ever earned in his life. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, then you said there were others came with them in the uh, spring of 19 and 2. Did they file on? Yes, they filed on uh, <laughs> uh, joining quarters of land there. Uh, Uncle George Baker filed on a quarter right uh, joining Dad's and uh, Aunt Ella and uh, Reuben Haskins filed on a quarter on the north side of the road from uh, Uncle George's. Uh, the uh, Reuben Haskins died in about, uh, probably about 1906, and uh, uh, Aunt Ella had a little girl that was born in uh, 1900, and they didn't have any way to get along very well, and uh, as soon as they uh, could, uh, they moved in with Dad, and uh, stayed a couple of years until she got a little finances built up. Dad helped her farm, and uh, well, they just farmed together is the size of it. He'd harness horses for her and everything so she could go out and farm. And as soon as she got a little finances together, she went back to Harper and started a hat shop. Oh. And, and what became of her claim? Her granddaughter still owns it, oh. and I farm it. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Uncle George's uh, homestead is owned by his son, Harvey it's Baker, which the... you folks might know. Yes, I, I know Harvey. Yes, it's still in the family, and mm -hmm. my father's homestead is owned by my sister, uh, Edith Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And do you own some of the land now? Yes, uh, I own... Uh, 180 acres that he bought in 1910 from uh, Jenny Fout, and uh, the adjoining 160 acres that he bought in uh, 1917. Uh, and I can't tell you, a woman homesteaded on it, and I can't tell you what her name is. Well, your father must have been prosperous then to be buying up land that soon after he filed. Uh, he used to tell about carrying a, he didn't have any bank account and he carried a silver dollar so he would not be completely broke until it was smooth. It had no <laughs> figures on either side of it. Uh, my sister has a, a, a check that, uh, or a copy of a check that Uncle George was crippled and couldn't follow a walking plow or anything like that. And uh, Dad plowed for people, broke sod for people around all over the country. Uh, some people, if they had ten dollars, thought they were wealthy enough they could hire a fellow to plow for a dollar an acre, which is the price he received. And he plowed sod for other people around over the country. Uh, later years, I've talked to fellows. Uh, he used to tell me that. Uh, he could plow three acres a day, and I talked to fellows and said, oh, you'd have a desperate time plowing three acres a day. And I said, well, that's what he, that's what he said he plowed. But uh, uh, people nowadays might not be familiar with the kind of day he put in. Uh, uh, he, he was, a, uh, he changed horses if he had a job that lasted a few days, he took different horses 
every day. He had enough horses so he could do that. But uh, what little money that there was to be made, that was about the only thing you could do in the country if you were willing to uh, get out and plow sod. Describe There's a walking a, plow. Well, I'm not that familiar with them. But uh, yeah, you. now I never did run one. Uh, they had a cutting shear, and uh, the uh, now this is a plow that's used to plow sod with. They had a cutting shear that was uh, 12 inches. It just took a 12 inch swath, mm -hmm. and uh, was about five or six inches high. And uh, the part above that, instead of being a moldboard, was uh, a uh, some strips of steel. And it was open between the strips. The sod would stay together, and there was no problem with that. And it was not a solid... Uh, but it didn't turn the sod over. Yes, it turned the, it sod, turned over, the sod over. But it was not a solid moldboard like you see moldboard plows nowadays. The, mm -hmm. the moldboard part of it was just a... Uh, of bands of steel that ran from the cutting shear up just high enough and turned out to turn the sod over. There's another joke that went with that. Uh, he was poor as a lot of people were and uh, and uh, he broke sod barefooted because he didn't feel like he could afford shoes to wear for that purpose. And uh, the sod was full of snakes, uh, more likely bull snakes than anything else. But uh, he he used to tell me, and in, in, uh, at the time when he was breaking sod, he weighed about 140 pounds. And all my lifetime that I knew him, he weighed over 200. And this is what made the story so funny. Uh, he said he'd be walking along, and, and that plow lay share was sharp and would just cut those snakes in two. And they'd be rolling around in the furrow back there and get on his bare feet and he'd jump right over the plow handles. Uh, and he said if the uh, if the lines from the horses would fall down and hit him on the bare foot, why, he'd jump right over the plow handles just the same. <laughs> so, but he didn't, he didn't wear shoes. He said he just, uh, he just was hard up that he had shoes, but he didn't think he could wear them for that purpose. And, uh, what kind of buildings did they build to live in? He lived in a dugout for about, I suppose, about four years, maybe. Three Can or four years. Can you describe a dugout for me? Uh, just the last year before he had a stroke and was unable to talk or anything, he took me over and showed me where his dugout was. And I had farmed right across the area for years and years, and I had... He'd never mentioned before where this was. Uh, I don't exactly know. It was just at the uh, end of a canyon where the land came up to be level. And he had dug out a place there and covered it over with something or other. And uh, He didn't tell you what? No. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how he had it fixed. Uh, I'm sure the mice and the rats and uh, and uh, another friend of the family, Bill Haight, told me when the, that his mother used to talk about uh, when they came out here in 1900 and 1902 in that period, the uh, sod grass was uh, six or seven inches high. And uh, Bill Haight has told me that his mother had told him that it was just alive and walking with fleas. And I'm sure that any uh, hole in the ground they lived in was <laughs> was fleas. terribly infested with fleas, mm -hmm. and, and of course and rats and mice and everything else, because they didn't have any way to keep them out. Mm -hmm. What kind of buildings did your uncle and your grandfather and the rest of the family build? Did they build sod houses? Or uh, I don't really know. Uh, I think they lived in uh, in tents through the first year or something until winter came the next year, and 
and uh, I don't exactly know. I I thought that he said once that my aunt and her husband lived in a in a dugout thing for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad's place on the west side of it had a uh, spring, and they made a uh, thing they called a curb down in there so that they could dip water out of it and uh, use it for anybody could use it that wanted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, before Aunt Ella's husband died, they dug an open well on her place, a uh, 120 some feet deep. And uh, it was uh, about four feet across and uh, they put a windlass up with a bucket and so forth, and all their spare time they spent down in that stupid thing, digging that down. And uh, he was down in there once uh, digging and... Uh, Your father? Yes, and uh, this uh, Reuben Haskins must have been an accident going someplace to happen. I don't really know, but... Uh, he was supposed to be running the windlass up there to pull the dirt out with, pull the bucket up with the dirt. And uh, he got the bucket of dirt up about the top and thought about something else and turned loose of the thing and the bucket fell down in there and and uh, Dad, Dad said he got up against the wall so tight he must have made an imprint in the wall and it just went by him and fell right in, on the ground in front of him. Well, that scared him to death. Well, but, wasn't it dangerous, uh, digging that deep on account of the oxygen? Well, I don't think that was the problem as, as badly as they worried about cave-ins. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in hard land. It was not in sandy land or anything, and, the, and uh, they never curbed them or anything like that they, or did anything about uh, the sidewalls, and I think they were more concerned about cave-in than anything else. Mm -hmm. The sickening part about that well is they only used it just two or three years and it was uh, in a little draw there in the southeast corner of my aunt's place. And a gopher started in, in the draw uh, upgrade a little ways and dug a hole down in there and uh, came in the well thing down 10 or 20 feet and uh, it came a rain and washed some dirt and filled the well up. Well, and they, did, I don't know how long it took them to dig it, but uh, they never did try to clean it out or anything. Mm -hmm. just, was the water good? I think how, it was all, all do right. You, do you know how high it raised in the... No, I don't. Uh, they stood in there in water and mud and so forth and, and dug it down away so that there'd be water come up in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they could just drop a bucket, you know, on the windlass and mm -hmm. pick up water. But I don't know... Uh, uh, I would imagine they've dug it so the water was four or five feet deep, probably. That would be about all they could do because you'd you'd <laughs> you'd have to stand in it while you were digging. Yeah. There were no drilling, uh, well drilling equipment in the country, mm -hmm. and uh, open well holes was all there, all you could do. Mm -hmm. Um, how come you're where did your father meet your mother and tell me that? Uh, my mother was born in uh, uh, Keokuk County, Iowa. And uh, give me her and, name again. Uh, Helen, or er, Fanny Graft. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she was just uh, three or four years old, uh, her family, I think there were two children, moved out to uh, an area by College Springs, Iowa. And uh, Grandfather Graft had asthma pretty bad. And uh, in 1907, he moved with his two younger children, uh, and I believe Mom went with them out to uh, Fullerton, Nebraska. And uh, the uh, Earl Graft, who was... Uh, two years older than mom. Uh, in uh, 1907, came out to the edge of Texas out here and uh, 
built a little house and so forth and uh, went back to Iowa and brought his new wife out here and uh, they started having children about as rapidly as was possible and uh, oh in uh, probably about 1911 or so mom came out here for a period of time to help him take care of the family and uh, she met dad and uh, and they were married in about uh, I believe Edith had recorded 1913 mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1917 uh, Uncle Earl and his family went back to Iowa uh, he didn't think he liked to raise wheat and kaffir corn out here and and uh, of course the crops were always a little intermittent sometimes you had crops and sometimes you didn't and and he'd always uh, raised hogs and all this kind of thing and fed all the crop he raised and he told me that he wasn't used to this kind of farming thing and but he stayed out here 10 years and then he left and went back to Iowa by that time they had uh, they have a child buried at the Poplar Grove Cemetery and I believe there might have been about five of them when they left and went back to Iowa. Mm -hmm. And that's how your father met your mother. Mm -hmm. And what year were they married then? Uh, I think in 1913. Um, he surely didn't take his bride to this dugout. No. Uh, well, one of the requirements about uh, homesteading was that you uh, had to have a uh, some kind of a house that was livable at the end of the five years. You had to have a certain amount of land broke and be farming. Uh, you even were supposed to have attempted to plant some fruit trees and uh, such things as that. I don't know if they realized how dry it was out in this country, but uh, uh, you were... I don't know what the full requirements were to abide by the homestead rules, but those were some of the things. You had to have a house that you could live in and, and have a certain number of acres that you farmed. And what and, kind of a house did uh, he have to bring his pride to then? Uh, he had built uh, the first in a about four years, I would imagine, after he came down here, he built a, a house that was about 14 by 20, I guess. And uh, he lived in it for a few years. And then he uh, used it for a granary. And I believe he had this other house built uh, when she married him. And uh, it was the west rooms of the house that is at the Catesby Church now. Yes. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the dimensions of it would be. Uh, probably about 20 by uh, 36, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when in 1925, when he moved his buildings over there uh, right there by Catesby why they uh, built onto that and made a two-story house and a large home of it mm -hmm. but at that time it was just the those west rooms of that house do you remember anything that your father might have told you about Catesby how it grew and then was abandoned or anything well uh, they were trying to get the uh, post office established there and uh, were already uh, attempting to stock some groceries when they came. Who was the family? Uh, the Rose family. Uh, I don't know and I remember seeing the old Mrs. Rose and she was the uh, she was the instigator of getting things done. Uh, the old gentleman was not in good health and uh, Mrs. Rose was a 
was a goer and a doer, and uh, they built quite a large uh, soddy on the south side of the road where the last Catesby store was there, and uh, were just trying to get uh, established uh, to uh, start a post office and and uh, a stock of uh, grocery things, what what things they could afford to buy and bring out there. Uh, they didn't make a trip to town every two or three days to get groceries. Whenever a farmer was going to town with a load of grain or to get some lumber or something like that. What town would that be? Well, it would uh, have been Gage at that time. Gage it was founded before Shattuck. Yes. Uh, they uh, they would send along with the farmer if he was going with his wagon and, and have him bring uh, some cans of this and that and the other, whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd bring it back out and and uh, help to keep their stock together. Mm -hmm. uh, the mail was delivered in a pretty uh, erratic... Uh, uh, there wasn't a regular carrier out there and... Uh, uh, if someone went to Gage, why, they brought the mail out to Catesby, and people came and picked it up their own mail. Uh, I never understood, but it had something to do with helping getting the post office started. They needed a certain number of names of people that would uh, get mail there before they could establish a post office. And uh, uh, Dad, among other people, uh, would take mail to somebody's home that they call Venus over in Beaver County and uh, pick up the, any letters that anyone wanted to mail. And probably they took them home with them and in two or three days or something if they had some business to go over to Keith before they took them over <laughs> when they went. And uh, then whoever went by with the wagon going to Gage the next time picked up the letters that we were going to be mailed out and took them to Gage. It uh, it was a kind of a hard way to get mail moved around, but that's what they started with. Uh, I don't know what year that uh, post office was established. Uh, well, there was a post office established at Venus. Yeah, I, I'm sure there was. That's where uh, my folks got their mail. Yeah. First. Uh, and somewhere in the period of time, uh, they started carrying, taking mail up to uh, Spearmore. Uh, when I was a boy, there was an old gentleman that had a Model T Ford that came down every morning and picked up the mail for Spearmore and took it up there. And uh, they had rural routes out of Spearmore. And... Uh, I think they came too late for him to bring the mail back. I think he brought it the next morning when he came to get the mail again. And uh, the letters and things that he picked up to be sent out were brought to Catesby and then went out the next day, I think. Mm -hmm. But the uh, when they started a route from Gage, they came uh, out through Cheney and out through Catesby and on out to the Logan area. And I don't know how much time they spent out there, but uh, when they came back... Uh, well, they it, went through Ivanhoe, too. Yes, yes. Uh, there were uh, various ones. And, and I don't know, it was first carried in a buggy, and they came out uh, one day and went back the next. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they couldn't make the trip in one day. No. And, uh, and the first carriers out of Catesby, uh, there were two men that carried. Do you remember their names? Van Manuel was one of them, and uh, Ralph Rose carried. Uh, was he the that, first, one of the first ones? Among them. Uh, I think the first thing they started was just a makeshift route. Uh, and, and just one party, I think, uh, and it might have been Gib Nixon. I never knew the man, but I heard Dad talk about him. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, 
they would take a lot of all of the mail that uh, came and and he would just start out to distribute it and uh, uh, as soon as they begin to get routes established why uh, uh, and I don't know how early a time they had the two routes but when I was a boy they still had the two routes and Ralph Rose carried one and Van Manuel carried one. They were about 30 mile routes and uh, Ralph Rose uh, wanted to move to uh, town someplace where there was high schools and so forth and they were wanting to combine the route in one so he moved away and uh, Van Manuel continued to carry the mail oh until he died Van Manuel continued to carry the mail until uh, 1942 or 43 and uh, then uh, he died and Anson Woods worked for the post office department in Arnett and uh, he came out and took the rural route over and carried uh, the mail until the post office closed at Catesby and uh, do you know what year? And I do not know for sure what year it, it closed. Uh, I can't be certain. Uh, I still farm land down there, but I had moved away. And uh, uh, I remember knowing that it closed up, but uh, I can't tell you when. Uh, Can you tell me some of the uh, early day settlers that lived close there to your folks were friends of your folks? and? You know, people in those days, they were willing to help each other. Well, and the neighborhood became a close... Yes. Uh, because of the fact that Dad was not married, and uh, I guess was a healthy individual, uh, uh, people called him day and night. Kids come and got him and everybody else, I guess. And uh, uh, he would go to uh, Gage or Shattuck and get doctors for people uh, made I don't know how many trips and uh, they uh, he was still in later years uh, would uh, go and set up with people that were extremely ill and, and uh, I don't know how he had that much time but uh, uh, he was called on a lot of times that there was a man by the name of Bill Miller that homesteaded on the quarter uh, uh, a half a mile west of Catesby. On which and, side of the road? On the north side of the road. Uh, and I uh, uh, I haven't any idea he sold his place to Van Manuel and it must have been in pretty early years. Uh, Where did Van Manuel live? Well Van Manuel homesteaded uh, three or four miles northeast of Catesby. Uh, in in some terribly poor land and uh, from the time that I remember him I think he moved on this place but then he bought a quarter of land uh, a mile north of Catesby and uh, on the west side of the road and uh, built a nice home there and so forth and lived there until he moved to Shattuck in about 1940, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, Ori Haight homesteaded right there close to Dad. Uh, he had a uh, quarter on uh, in two different sections, joining uh, 80s. Uh, Harry Roth homesteaded right south of Dad's homestead. And uh, his brother, and I fail to remember his name, he was left out of the country before, long before I remember, uh, homesteaded on a quarter right south of Uncle George's homestead. Now, you folks were all on the north side of the road, your uh, homesteads. Dad's, uh, Dad and Uncle George's homestead was... Uh, both on the north side mm -hmm. of a section. Mm -hmm. They were on the south side of the road, west of Catesby. Oh. And uh, Aunt Ella's homestead was uh, on the north side of the road. I see. In a different section. Hers was the southeast quarter.
quarter. Uncle George's was the northeast quarter, and Dad's was a northwest quarter mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you name any more of the early days? Well, the uh, I don't know what that old gentleman's name was. The old man White homesteaded out there. Would that uh, be Mrs. Ralph Rose's father? Yes. Uh, Flave Rose homesteaded uh, right where they built the sod house for Caseby. And uh, uh, Eben Rose, I believe, was uh, Ralph Rose's father. And uh, I think he took a homestead, but only by the abilities of some of the family was he able to uh, uh, do the farming necessary and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, Oh, I think Charlie Drolt homesteaded out there. Uh, I believe the old gentleman Hoke, his name was Will Hoke, mm -hmm. homesteaded uh, north there a couple of miles. Uh, Fred Ritter House homesteaded a mile west of Catesby and uh, about a mile and three quarters north. Lou Ritter House homesteaded... Uh, uh, about, uh, let's see, three miles north of Catesby. Uh, Fred Ritterhouse, I made a mistake, he's two and three quarter miles north mm -hmm. and a mile west from Catesby. Mm -hmm. uh, the old man Charlie King homesteaded out there and uh, you have to have been around there quite a while to remember Charlie King because he left in 1937 and went back to New York. Oh. Uh, I remember the old gentleman. Uh, he was a carpenter by trade and, uh, when he came out here to Homestead and uh, built some nice buildings, a nice home and uh, so forth up there on Clear Creek. That's what uh, I was going to ask if that was the King Range. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he was He was a... Uh, a good carpenter and builder. Uh, as close as he ever came to cuss words was by grapes. <laughs> uh, one of the few people I ever heard use that term. Uh, Lee Poland, of course, homesteaded there. Uh, Did these people all come about the same time? Within uh, Within two years, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. From 1900 through 1902, mm -hmm. uh, pretty well settled up the area. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a quarter of terribly rough quarter of land west of uh, Aunt Ella's homestead, and uh, we, I, my sister was going to look and try to find out, and I don't know if she learned the date, but it was not homesteaded for. Uh, seven or eight years later. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wanted it, I guess, and uh, a man by the name of Dick Teets came out there and homesteaded on it. And uh, not long after it was proved up, uh, he died, and uh, she left and went back over here by uh, Manchester. I think she had some family over there, and she had... Uh, they lost a child that's buried there near where that house is, and I don't suppose anybody knows where that grave is. Mm -hmm. And they, she had three children that uh, she took with her, and she left here. Uh, those children still own that quarter of land. Well, I remember my father talking about the teach mm -hmm. family. All right, um, what do you remember your father? telling you about uh, your grandfather and can you go back further than your father's generation? Well, uh, what country did they come from originally? Do you know? Uh, <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. Uh, that's why I think I probably should go back up there in Illinois and uh, try to dig out some relatives and see if they don't have information that goes back farther than we have. Uh, all that I ever learned and uh, 
And my father had talked about this that uh, he had heard when he was a child that the family came from Virginia out to Tennessee, and uh, I don't think they know where they came from. There's an interesting story, though, that uh, I didn't learn until later years. It probably would have made a smart aleck out of me when I was a kid if I'd known about it. Uh, there's a, a family uh, by the name of Gates from England, a man that was uh, bringing settlers to uh, uh, Virginia and the Carolinas. And uh, uh, the Graft family of my mother's did not come to this country until uh, uh, probably in the 1800s. But uh, this man came to, uh, I think, the Virginia area. Uh, there's an article in the, uh, if you have an encyclopedia, there is an article in there about this man, Gates. Uh, he was bringing settlers from England to settle that area. And the second or third trip that he made, uh, they uh, were in a storm and uh, and shipwrecked on Bermuda. And uh, there was at that time, uh, and this is, uh, his first landings was in 1609. Uh, it's some eight or ten years before the Pilgrims landed in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, when they shipwrecked, there was uh, large cedar trees, I guess, on Bermuda. And uh, not expecting anyone to come by and pick them up, they finally uh, found enough tools and cut enough large trees and, and uh, tied them together some way and made a raft and got on to the coast somehow or other. And uh, in later years when uh, this uh, English gentleman, Walter Cooper, came out here, he and I became close friends. And one time we were visiting about this and, and uh, he started laughing about it. He said, imagine me seeing you out here uh, he said, when, I, when anyone studies history in Bermuda, they study about uh, one of the first fellows that landed here was this man Gates that uh, blowed ashore in a wreckage of a ship and uh, then went on in a raft he'd made. And he thought it was very peculiar that he'd run on to someone that was a, a, a fur-off relative yes. of that man <laughs> out, yes. out here in the... Plains, mm -hmm. but uh, and that was your mother's people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite an interesting story. Uh, one of that family was uh, a uh, lieutenant in Washington's armies. Uh, wow. The same man was a lieutenant governor in, uh, I think, in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Uh, the uh, girls in the family are uh, can readily prove that they can join the uh, uh, daughters of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I haven't any idea. I imagine that uh, my father's family was in the country at that time, uh, probably in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any record uh, back that far. Uh, <laughs> well. Well, you were telling me that uh, your father told you that his people moved from Virginia to Tennessee and then... From, from Tennessee, Tennessee to Illinois. And tell me why they moved to Illinois. Well, uh, the uh, word of mouth that passed down to any of our family was that uh, uh, slavery was already a, a uh, problem as they saw it, and they did not approve of slavery, and uh, they left there uh, shortly after 1800 uh, and went to Illinois. The, uh, uh, at that time, there's, there's just the record that we have is of the one man in a rather large family, and I would imagine that some of the children were uh, 
uh, all the way from uh, five to twenty years old, probably when they moved to Illinois. Mm -hmm. And where did they settle in Illinois? Uh, in uh, Menard County, and I I can't tell you any uh, town or anything that was near around there. Mm -hmm. uh, Petersburg's the county seat. Yes, I remember here and seeing that on some of the uh, uh, records that we have. And you were telling me about the area that they, why did it become known? Well, there was a, a prairie, I guess it was not settled uh, too heavily when they moved there. And uh, as soon as this large family began to take wives and uh, an increase in numbers why they took up the uh, farmland I suppose and there was an area that they used to call uh, Baker's Prairie. I haven't any idea it isn't on a map and I haven't any idea where it is. Okay let's um, go back now to Catesby and uh, you told me you were born November the 4th 1924. By that time, your father was uh, pretty well located and had things going pretty well where you didn't really have to go along with the pioneer days. Well, not really. Uh, we, uh, I was born on his homestead in, uh, in November and in uh, the spring of 1925, he moved all of his buildings over uh, on some land that he had bought a few years before, uh, right there near Catesby. And, uh... I remember that house. I remember going by that and... There and, was a large barn and a yeah. double granary and, and well, a big house and... Uh -huh. And, uh... But in those times, there's no electricity and the telephone was just a rural thing around in the area. Mm -hmm. And, uh... You had a central, and you'd have to call central. And she well, uh, who who had the the uh, there was a switchboard in the Caseby store, oh. and uh, uh, when I was old enough to remember, why well, they attempted to keep a line in some repair or other to Laverne, and sometimes you could call somewhere, mm -hmm. but you couldn't hardly hear anything. Oh, <laughs> and uh, the rural phones that we had. Uh, Whenever a phone rang, they all rang, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, your number, uh, your ring was uh, a long or a two longs or two longs and a short or something or other. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, if your neighbor's ring was two longs and you wanted to find out what they were talking about, you just simply went and picked up the phone and listened to their conversation. And then in turn they could listen to you. Yes, yours. they could. <laughs> but that's the only way you had of keeping close touch with each other. Yes. Uh, we had, uh, when he moved to this other place, uh, he put up a, a water supply tank and put an underground pipe from the uh, tank down to the house, and we had water piped in our house, which uh, at that time... Uh, was lots of people of. lots of people didn't have That's yet right. we did not have a bathroom or any that sort of facility but mm -hmm. uh, uh we didn't have to walk after the water mm -hmm. uh, we had an ice box and uh the case B store uh kept ice and uh I can't remember what seventy five pounds of ice cost then it wasn't very much but uh it was a rare occasion if uh, we went and chipped any ice off of that to put in iced tea or anything like that. Uh, most of the days when I was a small boy, uh, my mother would send me with a bucket up to the windmill to get some fresh cool water to, to make lemonade or iced tea out of if we had such mm -hmm. thing. And uh, and that water was good. It was and good. It was and it cool. was cool. Yes. It was cold. How deep was your well? Uh, the well there at that place was a hundred feet deep. Mm -hmm. I got a drink out of it just a few days ago. 
You did? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's still in operation? Oh, yes. And you had a windmill? Yes. Uh, the children today doesn't know what a windmill does. Can you describe a windmill? And... Well, a uh, windmill uh, is uh, by a number, a wheel and uh, and some pieces of metal on it that are curved in such a way that when the wind blows against it, it causes it to turn. And uh, it runs some gears inside of a box. Now they have oil in them. And I remember when you, uh, when you had to climb up with an oil can and oil them about once a week. But now they are enclosed and they have oil in them. And, and uh, they run a device that pulls the pump rods uh, up and and uh, then presses them back down and, uh, and that brings the water that uh, along with uh, uh, a cylinder and uh, leathers and checks and a number of things that are down in the bottom of the well and all have to be working properly it causes that thing to be able to by the wind pump water I don't know uh, before they had those things, they pumped it by hand, and they must have spent a lot of time if they had any cattle or horses, because uh, it would have been a slow process. Mm -hmm. And hard work. Yes. they uh, To watch one, you would think that you could stand there and drink all the water it had pumped, but uh, uh, given a 24-hour period, they managed to take care of lots of livestock and, with no problem. And you had a spout where this water came out into what? Uh, we had uh, uh, a pipe that ran up in the air and uh, about uh, 15 feet and ran over into our supply tank. Oh. But we also had a valve down there about three feet from the ground that you could turn on and run water out into the stock tank. Mm -hmm. Or you could catch a bucket of water or fill your water jug, which I've done lots of times there. Mm -hmm. uh, water bags and various things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there where it runs out for the stock tank. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the water was uh, uh, just, a, just a nice cool temperature to drink. I believe that, that uh, people tell me in later years that most of the water pumped out of the ground is about 60 degrees. Uh, in modern day, uh, they have found that they can nicely cool homes with uh, pumped water and then run it through lines and just run it back in the ground. Hmm. Uh, it probably is the cheapest method in the world to cool a Have air home. conditioning. <laughs> yes. I would think so. They in turn have learned to heat their homes with the same thing. Uh, that water is 60 degrees, whether it's uh, uh, 100 degrees in the shade outside or whether it's zero. And uh, by running it through a uh, large water heater, after it's pumped out of the ground, they can raise it from 60 degrees up to 80 or 85 degrees and use that same water to warm their house with. Well, wow. that's interesting. Okay, tell me about your for school? I started the school at the Catesby School and it was located uh, uh, half a mile west of the little village of Catesby. Uh, when I was five years old, uh, old land, would have, guess it would have been in the, the fall of 1929, I suppose. And uh, I went through uh, eight years of school there. Do you remember your first school teacher? Uh, Lois McNeely. And I think she came from down around Arnett. She taught uh, the first two years of school that I went. Do you uh, know what date that school was? Founded. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's some more stories of that. Uh, the, the schoolhouse that was the first original building 
-hmm. is on the Wayne, it's the south part of the house that is on the Wayne Pearsall farm right now. Wow. Now that's what my father has told me, mm -hmm. and uh, not a very large building. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, a few of the neighbors went together and they went over there and on the, on the canyon uh, near the, in the, I don't know if it's on the north end of the Teach Place there somewhere, and hauled rock over there and uh, unloaded him. Uh, Mr. Haight, when he came to the country, had some Indian ponies that he was trying to work, and uh, they got their wagons loaded with rock over there at the canyon, and uh, his, his Indian ponies balked and wouldn't pull the wagon. And they left him there, and when they got their rock unloaded and Dad was going up the hill west to go home, he saw him coming with his Indian ponies. He'd finally got them started and, and uh, went over and got his little rock unloaded. Uh, my uh, aunt uh, had a daughter that, as I said previously, was born in 1900, and uh, she started the school at Catesby. Mm -hmm. So it would have been built in 1905 or 6, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I heard Dad say when they built that building. Uh, in later years, uh, he was on the school board for 27 years, and uh, he did not have a sixth grade education. <laughs> well, now this uh, building, was it built out of the rock? No, it was that was just to be that a just foundation. foundation thing. They laid them around and mm -hmm. and uh, built the school up on. But it was built out of timber. Out yes, of wood. out of lumber. Mm -hmm. And then your uh, she would be your cousin. Would yes, be one of the first pupils there. One of the early ones. Uh, Bill Haight uh, started the school there. Uh, was he the oldest of the Haight? Yes, and. Uh, I think uh, Bill Haight was born in 98, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a couple years or so older than my cousin. Uh, now, there might not have been a school when he was six years old and ready to start. I mm -hmm. don't know for sure about that. I think, uh, I think Bill was born in about 1900, wasn't he? Uh, Two or three years before 1900. He was born when they came out here, and they mm -hmm. came the year before Dad did in 1901. They came in 1901. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, he was born in 97 or 98, I think. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, there was a lady, uh, a family that homesteaded on the, uh, on the quarter of land that is... Uh, a mile west of Catesby and a mile north and uh, about a half a mile west. And uh, the man endeavored to be a Baptist minister, and I think that might be why they left. He wanted to go into the ministry. But the woman had uh, an education, I guess, and uh, took a horse and buggy and helped start schools all over that neighborhood. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if she uh, helped them start their first school there, but she did over in the Richards community mm -hmm. and some others around there. She went, uh, they started their school in order to get enough pupils together and see what they were going to do in somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went every day, and, and at that time it would have been over to that area, it would have been five miles. In the wintertime, it would have been a nasty trip twice a day. Mm -hmm. But she helped them start the school there, and I wouldn't be surprised that she started the one at Caseby. Mm -hmm. You don't remember their names? No, I don't. Uh, they left there uh, uh, about the time they proved their land. I saw her name on some... Uh, on some records a few weeks ago, but I can't remember what the name was. I see who... Uh, and the uh, family of the old family of Terrell uh -huh. uh, bought that. their place and moved on that mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. And it would have been in 
1907 probably when they left and Terrell's moved there. Mm -hmm. I remember the Terrell family. I knew them. Oh. Uh, that is, I, I didn't know the old folks, but I knew the younger ones. Okay. And uh, do you remember any experiences uh, at your school that you would want to tell me about? Any particular well, interesting ones? Uh, I remember in the 30s uh, that they had to close school sometimes because it got so dusty around there you couldn't see the kerosene lamps up in the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd, they'd close school and the, and the Tell kids... Tell me about the dust storms. You remember them, don't oh, you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I guess it's uh, about as horrible as somebody living through a, a uh, tornado that lasted for five years. Not quite that bad, but uh, uh, I can't remember how many times that there were days you couldn't see the sun for the dust being that thick. Uh, most of the homes in the area were not, uh, no one had ever times when uh, you could not see the sun all day and uh, the dust uh, came in the houses uh, settled on the tables and everything else on the curtains uh, and I remember that when the time came in the 40s when people began to wire their homes for electricity when the REA came that uh, they would get up in the attics of houses and find that they had as much as six inches of uh, dust that had settled in from those periods of time. Uh, most of the fields in the country blowed at some time or other and some of them seriously uh, people left the country and left farms uh, laying idle and uh, they of course would blow and uh, became a problem for those that stayed to attempt to raise anything because some of the land that blowed over that was not being uh, managed or taken care of would blow out uh, crops that you already had up and uh, could see the crop and and you thought you had a possibility of raising something in the, and the uh, adjoining place maybe was uh, idle and no one lived on it and, and it would blow and destroy your crop. I remember an instance of uh, when I might have been about 10 years old uh, and I'm sure they had let out school because it was blowing dust so bad you couldn't, uh, we couldn't have school. And my father and I was up in the, the southwest corner of his field with an old John Deere tractor on lugs and a two-row lister. And uh, he would run it a while and I would run it a while. And uh, the land laid right southwest of us belonged to Van Manuel and it was idle and no one was farming it or anything and, and uh, the dust would blow so bad that when you uh, when you went towards the northwest you put your hand and your arm up beside your face to keep it from cutting your face and when you turned around at the fence and went back southeast you put your hand and arm up some of the times you couldn't see the radiator cap you could just see the ground down beside you where you'd listed the last round. And and, uh, and that's what guided you? Yes, at, at times that's all you could see. Mm -hmm. uh, well, did this listing stop the blowing? Uh, if there was enough moisture to turn up some clods, uh, it would hold it for a, a period of time. But I have seen fields in that time that they listed one day and uh, the wind blew all night and they were level the next day. You could not see where they listed. 
uh, uh, how did your father manage those years? Did he have livestock? We had some livestock. Uh, we farmed uh, some wheat and uh, strangely enough in the spring every year we would get a little rain and uh, he always managed to raise some oats. Uh, not a lot, but enough to take care of milk cows and such things. And uh, most of those years, we were able to raise uh, some kind of cane, usually this old African millet cane. But the wheat prospects became extremely difficult. Uh, we had a, uh, a Sanders one-way plow that was extremely worthless for a one-way and uh, we would uh, in August we would he and I would plow our ground and uh, the job of plowing was so poor you could not tell where the furrow was uh, you couldn't uh, it was dry and hard and, and uh, but we would go ahead and and uh, what he called scratch over it and uh, almost every year about the last three days of August, we would get a rain, uh, usually around three quarters of an inch. And uh, since we did not have cheat and joint grass and all these problems that we do now, uh, we would just drill in that remains of where we had tried to plow. And uh, in the fall, uh, uh, we get some little old rains, just a quarter of an inch or three or four tenths or something once in a while. And only one year did he fail to have some wheat pasture and uh, raised seven or eight bushel of wheat to the acre or something. And uh, the old wooden granary that was there for a long time had the names of people that lived I suppose within 20 mile, some of them I didn't know that they came and bought seed wheat from him. And uh, he always sold it at the same price it was in town. Uh, he didn't ever intend to gouge anyone. And uh, we didn't have a pickup or a truck and uh, no way to haul it to town except with a trailer. And he said he felt like it was a good way to get rid of it and save hauling it, so uh, he just sold it at whatever price it was in town. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a man that lived west of us uh, by the name of Harris. Uh, he was the father of Wesley Harris and Lloyd Harris. Came over and bought uh, something like 25 bushel of wheat. Uh, probably when I was gone to school or something because I don't remember about it mm -hmm. and uh, he began to count him out uh, nickels and dimes and quarters and and uh, to pay for this wheat and uh, this is the only occurrence I ever heard exactly like this he said he'd robbed his kids piggy banks in order to get uh, enough change to buy 25 bushel of seed wheat. Oh, what was the price of wheat? Uh, I, from 33 or 4 up until uh, 38, uh, I doubt if it got to a dollar a bushel. Uh, we sold wheat in 1938. We had an enormous crop. And it was 60 cents. In 1938? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we put a bunch, a lot of wheat on the ground, and uh, he hired Odin Shepherd with two helpers, and he scooped it off the ground and hauled it to Follett. It's about 15 miles for three cents a bushel. And uh, the wheat was worth 60 cents. But in Previous to that time, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
when I first remember it was uh, in 32 or 3 in that period of time, it, it got down to just 25 cents a bushel or something. Mm -hmm. But they were raising good wheat then. And uh, I think maybe through 1933, and uh, then there's a period of time there that uh, uh, just, just hardly anyone had any wheat. Do you remember Black Sunday? What they call Black Sunday? Oh, yes, but not just in a particular. Uh, there was so confounded many days that looked <laughs> almost <laughs> as bad that I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I remember that it just rolled up like a fog, mm -hmm. uh, and the sun was shining and and uh, so forth, and you could see this this cloud coming, and uh, mm -hmm. it looked like a storm cloud. Mm -hmm. And uh, there wasn't very much wind blowing. It was uh, kind of decently calm, but that that thing when it hit, oh my gosh, you could hardly stand up outside. And uh, it got dark in five minutes. Yes. Uh, but I I remember so so many other storms, maybe they didn't come up as furiously as that, that, uh, that the dust blowed all day long and... and uh, Which direction did the dust usually come from? From the southwest. Uh, you could almost depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then uh, after you graduated from the eighth grade, what did you do? Uh, I rode the school bus to uh, Shattuck. Uh, the bus had started out in that area two years previous, and uh, in 1938, in that fall term, I started the Shattuck to school and rode the bus. Uh, it was quite a long ride every day, and uh, the roads were not very good. They were not graded up like they are now at all. And uh, we were beginning to get some uh, rain and a uh, little snow and so forth. And the water and mud ran right down the middle of the roads and it it was a problem. But, You'd uh, get stuck? Yes. And the boys would get out and push? We'd get stuck and, and uh, have all kind of problems sometimes. Uh, might not get down there sometimes until 10 or 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Do you remember but who your bus driver was? The first bus driver was Roy Peetum. And uh, I believe the next driver was uh, Roy Starbuck. I visited with his son that runs a cafe in Shattuck just the other day. Uh, had a nice visit with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, let's see, Orville Clark drove the bus one year. And I think he started and drove part of this my last year. And then Clifford Heiner was going to school down there, and he drove the bus part of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, see, who was Clifford's dad? Hobart Heiner. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Clifford's grandfather was uh, Fred Ritterhouse. Yes. And uh, you graduated from high school yes. in Shattuck. Did you go on to college? Anyway? No. What I, did you uh, do then? Well, I s started uh, working uh, there on my father's farm, and uh, uh, I had some cows and, and hogs and so forth, and I worked out some. Uh, the war had started. World War II started in uh, December of 1941, and... Uh, well, what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in the spring of 1942, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just going to be a matter of time until I went in the service. Uh, I was not 18 until uh, November of 42, and that's when I registered for the draft. And uh, in the spring of 43, they uh, were getting about ready to draft me. And uh, 
you there was no hands available to work in the harvest fields or do much and uh, my father and I discussed uh, this problem a little and uh, he asked me if I would uh, be agreeable to wait and help harvest and and I was and and so uh, we went down and met with the draft board and and got a deferment for a short period of time and uh, then I went to the army and uh, uh, went and took my physical in fact the 24th of uh, August in 1943 and I went to Fort Sill the 14th of September of 1943 to report for service. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me something about your training there at Fort Sill? I spent only about 10 days at Fort Sill. Uh, meantime we took a number of uh, uh, tests and so forth and uh, that's really about uh, if you call KP and such stuff as that training, I did some of that while I was there. Mm -hmm. But we didn't engage in any training activity, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, did not do very well in school, in grade or high school. I don't know if my interests were someplace else, but I didn't make very good grades. And. Uh, when they gave us our tests, uh, the first test was 150 question, and uh, I had heard some fellows say that you just wanted to skim through it and answer all the ones that you could. You had something like a, a hour and a half or two hour period, I don't remember the time limit. And uh, others said, oh, you wanted to answer as many as you as you came to them, and uh, you had to pick an idea about how you wanted to do, and I elected to answer as many questions as I could when I came, as I came to them. And uh, after that test was finished and they uh, uh, checked the uh, grading, they called a certain number of names and they all got up and left the room and uh, the remainder of us stayed and took a uh, mechanical aptitude test and I can't remember how many questions there were in it but there was a given length of time that you had to answer the questions and uh, when it was completed why well, they checked the uh, the uh, grade that you made on it and a number of names were again called off and uh, a certain amount of them uh, that they called left the room and uh, then they proceeded to give the, the ones of us that were still there a, uh, a listen to uh, Morse code, the dots and dashes, and write down what we thought it was. and. Uh, as soon as that test was completed and they checked the grades, uh, they called off a list of names and uh, had those fellows leave the room. And I think we started with about 200 and I don't believe there were 40 of us left in the room when they finished with the three things. And as a boy I had wanted to, be, uh, wanted to fly an airplane. I thought I really did want to and uh, I went down to the Air Force building down there uh, probably a dozen times and tried to get them to uh, to let me uh, go into the Air Force and uh, the uh, my physical examination was was perfect and uh, uh, they finally told me that I had made 119 on that uh, 150 question test and uh, but their uh, problem seemed to be they kept telling me that I was three pounds too light and they wouldn't take me in the Air Force thing. 
And uh, in about 10 days, there were some buses came along and, and uh, loaded up a large number of us, and we started off southwest. And uh, we went through Wichita Falls, and uh, until I got that far, I had ho high hopes that we were going to that Air Force camp. And uh, we go right on through Wichita Falls and, and uh, go down to Mineral Wells, and out east of Mineral Wells was a uh, infantry replacement training center. And uh, they unloaded a large number of them in, uh, in some infantry battalions, and uh, just a few of us stayed on the bus and went over and uh, went in the 52nd Battalion that was the Infantry Communications. And it was just because of these grades that we'd made on this test that we got in that. Uh, it had mostly to do with infantry type of communications, a, a radio platoon, a wire platoon, which I trained in. And uh, was a 17-week training cycle, and uh, was a was a pretty tough road to hoe. I guarantee you, it wasn't as bad as it was over in the straight infantry training thing, but uh, it sure uh, sorted the men from the boys. I thought I was in pretty good physical condition. I'd done lots of of uh, wheat scooping and fence building and cattle wrestling and so forth and it was in September when we get down there and I thought I was in pretty good shape but I really had cause to feel sorry for some fellows that had never done any physical work in their life because it sure it sure it was, was tough was on tough. them uh, we had uh, two ages of men in our platoon and uh, they were either 18 and 19 years old or they were late draftees that was past 30 and uh, I remember one fellow that had ulcers when he came down there and uh, they decided that he needed to have all of his teeth pulled and uh, uh, oh he uh, the first thing we did every morning was what they referred to as a speed hike and it was about four miles and a half and uh, about a half a mile from camp was a uh, uh, hill on the road that was steep enough that you could nearly reach down in front of you and touch the ground. Uh, it was a asphalt road and they had marked it with inch deep marks so that the vehicles could get up it all right. And we marched up that and went off out there about two mile, two and a quarter mile and, and then came back within the first hour. And uh, we started without any pack or, or anything and then we started carrying a, a, a rifle belt with a canteen and then we progressed to a, uh, a field pack, which is just a small thing, and finally then to a full pack, which included uh, your blanket and shelter half and, and rifle and helmet and the whole business. Uh, this fellow that had the ulcers marched just two or three people from over from me, and... Uh, he could not make it up that hill with all that gear. And uh, when I went in the service, I weighed 128 pounds without any clothing. And in two months, I weighed 160. And uh, when we'd come to that hill, we'd divide up his pack and rifle and stuff. One fellow would take one article and somebody else would take something else. And... Uh, when we'd get up the hill out on level ground, why, uh, he could make it then. And I've carried my own and his pack a number of times up that area there. How far was it up there? Oh, it was probably 125 yards or 150 yards or so. Mm -hmm. But it, it was steep enough it really took the 
way out of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought I was a pretty good man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to be to carry your own uh, and his. I wasn't yet 19. Mm -hmm. uh, my birthday would would be in November, and I would be 19. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my 20th go? birthday, I was on a ship going along the coast of New Guinea. Oh, they shipped you out from there then? Uh, I left, uh, I did not get a furlough, but uh, I had 13 days to report after I finished basic training at Camp Walters, Texas. I had 13 days to report to Fort Ord, California. And during that period of time, I was able to spend about seven or eight days at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went on to uh, Fort Ord and spent about a uh, two-week period there. And uh, they had an obstacle course, incidentally, that you went through without any pack or rifle. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of fellows that didn't couldn't make it. Well. Uh, you didn't carry the gear with you. You just endeavored to get through it with your clothes. And <laughs> what was that? Climbing over obstacles or what? Well, uh, numerous things. Uh, the uh, place that seemed to cause the most problem with most fellas was a wall about 30 feet high with some ropes hanging down from it. And uh, they had knots in them. And... Uh, uh, I suppose there were a hundred men that uh, started ahead of me, and when I got to that place, there's most of them standing around there, and they can't make it up that rope thing to get over the top. And uh, did you make? It? I had no problem. <laughs> you just it. went over the top. When I threw my leg over the top, there was an officer standing down there raising the dickens with them and eating them up about going on. And when I threw my leg over the top, he said, now there's the way you ought to do it, but I don't think it helped their situation any. Uh, you stood on a boardwalk up there about 30 feet high, and there was some ropes uh, swinging across a uh, little old water hole. Mm, and it was prob it. it was probably a hundred feet out there, and you uh, had to uh, hand walk those ropes across above that water out to the other side. When I got over there, there was about five fellows laying on the ground there resting, and out of however many had already started, I'm sure there were over a hundred of them. We were the only ones that had got that far up to that point. It it was. Uh, <laughs> kind of tended to iron out the uh, yes <laughs> and we went from there spent about two weeks there and uh, went up to uh, Camp Stoneman uh, it's right by uh, Pittsburgh California and uh, it's uh, right adjoining to part of the uh, Bay Area that comes back up the quite a ways from San Francisco, uh, all those Bay Areas that are back in, I didn't realize until I looked at maps later years that that extended that far. But we spent about two weeks there, and they marched us down one day and put a large number of us on a little old excursion boat, and uh, the sign above the uh, wharf where we walked on the boat said under these portals pass the best damn soldiers in the world <laughs> uh it was the 19th of march in 1944 uh well, we went down to uh, san francisco and uh, uh walked across the dock there it was getting dark or just after dark and uh got on a large troop ship and uh, the next morning when we woke up uh, down in the holes of that thing uh, uh, some of the men were already sick and uh, they were sure we were out to sea and uh, another fellow and I got up and put our clothes on and oh they were throwing up in their helmets and so forth around some were already 
We went up on the deck and there we sat with the dock. We hadn't even moved yet. It and, was nerves, wasn't it? Well, I suppose the the boat would move a little with the yes. and bump against the dock a little and mm -hmm. something. I don't know. I was too young to have any nerves, I guess. <laughs> it didn't. Well, what happened to the men that didn't make the wall? Did they go ahead and take them? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I, I don't know. They finally just let them go, I guess, walk around it or something. I don't know what they did. But uh, that was... Uh, that was the worst experience on was that it? training. Yes, out there. Uh, yeah. We went through an obstacle course all the time at uh, in training down here at Camp Walters. Uh, Where is Camp Walters? Well, it's still there. Uh, it's not in use anymore. It's about three or four miles uh, just east out of Mineral Wells, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 40,000 troops and men in training besides the uh, personnel that we call cadre that were permanent personnel that took care of all the training operations. Well, um, that was a large camp. Oh then. yes, quite a, the little old town of Mineral Wells had less than 10,000 in it and on Saturday evening, if nearly most of them got into town, they <laughs> looked like a group of ants walking around. They. <laughs> Um, you could get a pass uh, to go to Fort Worth or or Wichita Falls or someplace, but you had to uh, apply for it a few days in advance and everything. And, and uh, did you ever get one? I I went to Wichita Falls once uh, in hopes of meeting a uh, neighbor boy up there, and uh, he was stationed in. Uh, Shepherd Field at Wichita Falls, and I went in the uh, camp and went to where his uh, found his bed all right. And the guy, the men said that he, his uh, parents and his wife had come down there, and they were in a motel someplace, and no one knew where they were. Oh, so I didn't get yeah. to. Who was the boy? Uh, it was uh, Junior Ward. Uh, his father's name was Fenton Ward, and he moved out there on the, the Rose land oh. and lived there about three or four years or something like that. And uh, we became good friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to the ship now. You you were on the ship. and uh, it, it was the uh, General Brooks. Uh, the other ships, I don't remember the name of them, yes. but I do remember that one. Uh -huh. How many soldiers was on that? There were uh, 4,500 enlisted men and 500 officers that were being shipped over as uh, replacements. And uh, the crew, uh, enlisted personnel on this ship were uh, uh, Australians that had been to Canada for some sort of training and were on their way back to uh, uh, Australia, I guess. And I had a hard time. Uh, one of them asked me what the bloody time was, and I could not understand what he meant. And finally, after three or four tries, uh, we finally got together so that I could tell him what time it was. Uh, in about 36 hours after we left San Francisco, uh, and I suppose I should relate the the uh, situation of a lot of men crying when they left the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> uh, in about 36 hours, you uh, the sailors told me that there is a backwash from the continent that causes extremely rough water rough seas and uh, I would venture to say that 90% of the men on the ship uh, if they were not already ill became ill by the time we got through that area. Uh, I did not ever uh, become ill from rough seas of all the uh, sea adventures that I was on. And after we passed through that period in 10 or 12 hours, why uh, mostly the Pacific Ocean is 
it was relatively calm. Uh, the uh, uh, sea would be uh, at times uh, if you were in a uh, low place in the ocean you could see ocean higher than your ship all around you. Uh, it must have been uh, those waves must have been a hundred or 150 feet deep and the, and they would be uh, uh, probably a quarter to a half a mile across from the top of the crest of one to the crest of the other and the uh, the low places in between there just looked like valleys and then pretty soon you'd be on a crest and, and you could see the ocean down in the, in the low areas on both sides uh, when I tell my wife about that, she doesn't want to hear anymore because she's afraid it'll make her ill just just to envision what it what it looked like. Well, go ahead and tell uh, me. One time in uh, all the time that I spent on the water, I saw the ocean down near the equator when uh, it looked like a plate of glass. Uh, looked like you could just step over the side and start off a foot. There was not a ripple or a wave or any any heaving or anything. And uh, during the course of overseas time, I spent about two months on the water. And that's the only time I ever saw the ocean that calm. Uh, the only waves there were anywhere was from behind the ship where the propellers created waves. This is quite a thing for a boy that grew out in the semi desert of Oklahoma to see. Uh, I had read in uh, geography books that something like three fourths of the world is supposed to be covered with water, and I thought those people were the biggest liars I'd ever heard of. But I believe them now. <laughs> uh, we spent 16 or 17 days on the water. And we arrived at New Caledonia uh, on the 4th of April. And uh, I went in a uh, replacement depot, 6th replacement depot, of just a little way out of the town of Numea. The first night I'm there, I want somebody to show me what the Southern Cross looks like. And uh, one of the men took me outside and, and uh, showed me how to find the Southern Cross. Uh, the Northern Star is not visible in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, sailing vessels for a long time had used the Southern Cross as their guiding, guiding stars uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. I think if I was down there now I couldn't find it again. But uh, What did it look like? Well, it was uh, uh, just some, uh, uh, I believe there were uh, five stars in it. I'm not sure, and uh, it just formed in a in a perfect cross. But uh, and I they... couldn't find it until he showed me uh, uh -huh. what to look for. And is uh, that what the sailors went by? Well, yeah. in olden yeah. times they. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, they used mm -hmm. that for their guide. Uh, I was in that uh, replacement depot about two weeks, and then they moved us, a number of us, over to a, a camp they called a staging area. And uh, that was a rat hole. Uh, they just picked men out of the uh, replacements for cooks and uh, then the uh, trucks would come by and pick us up and take us out to work at places that they had jobs they wanted to do. We went out and worked all night one night moving cement and uh, bags of cement and I talked to some fellows two or three days later that went out and moved that cement back where we had moved it from and uh, after a period there of Oh, maybe two weeks. Uh, a truck came in there one day and uh, uh, picked up five 
men, and uh, they were all men that I had taken basic training with, and uh, uh, their names were were uh, uh, Paul Baker and Ralph Baker, and uh, a man by the name of Barnes, a young fellow, and a man by the name of Collins, and a man by the name of Dix, and uh, that's all they wanted and that's all they took and that's how they picked them was just by an alphabetical order. Well they weren't originally from Catesby. No, these men were, uh, uh, Paul Baker was from uh, Ponca City, Oklahoma and uh, uh, Barnes was from uh, I think Ohio and uh, Collins was from uh, a suburb of Detroit, and uh, Dix was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but we had all trained in the same unit in Camp Walters, and uh, just because of a little communications training, uh, this truck that picked us up was from the 230th Signal Operations Company, and that's where I spent the rest of the time overseas, was in that unit. Well, uh, what was your duties and where did you go? Well, in uh, when I went in that company in New Caledonia in uh, uh, probably uh, in May, uh, they had already been in New Caledonia, the original part of the company, for uh, about a year and a half. And uh, the company was able to do all kinds of communication work and uh, the thing that I chose to work at was uh, with the uh, what they call their line crews uh, they set poles and uh, and put up uh, uh, open wire and put up uh, lead cable and and such work as that uh, involved in the company were men that did uh, installation of telephones uh, also, uh, a few men that uh, did installation and operation of switchboards. There was a, a a number of men that worked as switchboard operators. There was uh, a, a, a three-man crew that uh, did repair work on radio teletype and some radio teletype operators. There was also uh, radio uh, experts, uh, repairmen, and uh, and radio uh, operators. We had a, uh, I believe, about a three or four man crew that were uh, uh, cable splicers, and uh, that's uh, rather an interesting uh, job. Uh, we had a group of men that had jeeps assigned to them, and uh, they delivered uh, hand messages that they did not want to send by any other means. Mm -hmm. I may have missed some, but uh, uh, it was a. I always wondered how I ever got in such a thing because uh, a lot of these men had worked for uh, Bell and. Uh, uh, they were 25 to 30 years old and uh, some men that really knew the communications business before they ever went in the service. And uh, this was really a unique company. I have understood there were two signal operations companies in the Pacific and there were two in the European theater and that's all the signal operations companies that that I understood there were. And you were in one of these? Yes, the mm -hmm. 230th. What, what was your job in that? Uh, I worked on the line crews to uh, uh, set poles and, and uh, put up uh, lead cable and, and put up open wire and whatever uh, went with that job. I worked downtown in Numea for a uh, period of time with a sergeant. When they first came to the island, they put up 
miles and miles of field wire, put it on poles, and uh, as they uh, were there longer in progress, they put up open wire and, and lead cable. And uh, this field wire was just hanging every place, and they wanted to take down all of it that was not in use. And I worked on a crew for probably 30 days, uh, taking that wire, that stuff down. During that period of time, uh, the uh, poles they used there were native trees, and uh, they were so hard that you had to file the hooks that you climb poles with almost every day and keep them so sharp that they would nearly penetrate your skin. Uh, they had to be that sharp for you to climb a pole. They, the, the wood was so hard on those trees, you could hardly climb them. And in climbing one of those uh, that was real small at the top, uh, I put my belt on it and was reaching up to uh, put the clips in the, in the wire and uh, fell off a pole, fell down off of it skin myself up some. I guess that's the only accident I got involved in. Well, you were lucky. <laughs> but uh, uh, the camp area that we went in uh, had been their camp since they had been there. And uh, during that summer of 44, they decided, uh, someone did, that they wanted to build a, a Pentagon building in that camp area. So we had to move. And uh, they filled it up higher with dirt and built a thing that uh, we jokingly referred to as a, the plywood pentagon. It was a, a building designed after the pentagon building in Washington, only it was built entirely of plywood. And our company was supposed to be around 240 men and uh, they had increased in, up to uh, 350 or 60. And uh, they, uh, the man that had been the company commander had left about two weeks before I came in the company. And a man that uh, grew up in Oklahoma over at Sepulpa uh, was the company commander. And about the time we moved to the, another camp, the, uh, they started uh, organizing a, uh, a signal uh, battalion and uh, the former uh, officer was going to be the commander of it. And they transferred out all the men that they didn't want, I guess, out of our company into that group. Uh, it was built on a uh, they took a bulldozer and on a hillside and they just flattened, uh, made some terrace looking areas up there and set the tents on them. And I never did know how I got into that, but uh, a man from the motor pool, and I suppose because I grew up on a farm or something, uh, he and I got the job of uh, laying the water lines for the mess tent and the uh, showers and all that kind of thing. Worked on it, uh, I don't know how long, 30 days or a month or some, month and a half or something. I don't know just how long it took us to get it done. But uh, during that time, I hurt my back. Uh, we were putting in 20-foot joints of 2-inch pipe to connect the things with. And uh, uh, I hurt my back and had to go on sick call. And, uh, they tape me all up and I visit with my doctor and he jokes me about how did you like that tape down there and that heat and everything. And, and uh, in three days when I went back and they took the tape off, I was already broke out under that tape. Uh, but anyway, uh, we uh, as a company, uh, about a hundred men left uh, uh, probably around the 1st of October or maybe in the last of September and uh, went on up in the island someplace and made the invasion in uh, Leyte in the Philippines. 
in uh, oh you were in that i didn't i didn't make the invasion oh you didn't uh the rest of us stayed there and and continued to stencil boxes and trucks and so forth and and then we left uh probably just in the last uh, two or three days of october i had a notebook when i got home that i kept the dates of every place that i when I left and when I arrived and so forth, and I lost the notebook a number of years back, and uh, That's too bad. I can't give really exact dates, but uh, it was within the last four or five days or so of October we left New Caledonia, and a ship had just come from uh, San Francisco that was a converted luxury liner, and. Uh, we got on that ship with some other troops and, that came from San Francisco and some got on there. A huge vessel had a dining room, uh, oh, I suppose uh, four or five times larger than a basketball court. And uh, the former thing we had when you went to eat uh, was pretty small areas but this had an enormous room. They showed movies in there and so forth. Uh, we went up uh, along the coast of New Guinea and uh, uh, I, I think I told you before, uh, uh, the 4th of November on my birthday, uh, we were on that ship and moving the co along the north coast of New Guinea. Uh, we landed at uh, Hollandria on the 7th of November and uh, spent uh, a month there and uh, it was just two or three degrees from the equator, uh, two or three or five or something like that and uh, one of the men had a thermometer that would go to 140 degrees and he was afraid to put it out in the sun. He kept it in a tent and it would go to 125 or 30 degrees. Uh, there was a mountain stream about 200 yards from our camp and someone had fixed, there was a waterfall about uh, 12 feet high and uh, someone had fixed some boards and uh, that were rather cracked and so forth and stood them up and the water would run out in those boards and run through, you know. Well, we'd walk over there and take a shower in that mountain stream water, and it was just as cold as could be. Uh, we would not dry off. We'd just wrap a towel around us and start back to the tent, and by the time we got there, we were not only dry, we were sweating again. Mm -hmm. uh, it was terrible hot there. Mm -hmm. and uh, Did it rain every day there? Uh, not, not quite so bad, but, uh, uh, something I want to mention, uh, in the period of time that we were in New Caledonia, the men that had been there about two years said they had only seen distant lightning twice, way off in, on the ocean someplace, and, uh, they had the most horrible lightning storms in New Guinea, there where we were camped, that I ever saw. Uh, it, the trees were torn up and, and uh, oh, it just rained by buckets full when it rained. I don't remember that it rained every day or so, but... Uh, what kind of wild animals were there? At the we never Guinea? saw any. The, the area had been warred over some and uh, we didn't see any. Uh, mm -hmm. We were not very far from the ocean and uh, there was not too mountainous area uh, just back of the camp on inland why it was mountainous region uh, and what about mail service while you were over there well when you move every once in a while it wasn't good but uh, it wasn't their fault they tried mm -hmm. uh, when I got to New Caledonia, 
uh, as long as I was in those replacement areas, I could not tell my parents where I was. Yes. And as soon as I was assigned into the uh, 230th Signal Operations Company, uh, this captain told us that we could ride home and tell our folks where we were. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took about a week, all the mail was air mail, of course, mm -hmm. but it took about a week for a letter to get from there home. Mm -hmm. And uh, a uh, funny thing about that, when they got the letter and I told them where I was, uh, I'm sure they looked at each other and said, well, where in the name of time is New Caledonia? It's just a little old island off down there in the Pacific. And uh, Dad had bought an atlas in 1910, a world atlas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Do you still have that? Yes. And uh, Edith, I think, came over and they... They hunted and hunted until they found that little island down there. <laughs> but uh, whenever you moved from one island to another, the last mail that you would send would progress on home in its seven or eight day period. But the mail that was coming to you would be held up uh, until they uh, found what your location was going to be. And uh, I suppose they knew but where you were going, but uh, uh, there was a pretty bad mess up with that. Uh, while we were on this ship going along New Guinea, north on the north shore, they made us go ashore, our company, at uh, uh, I think a little old village of Lay, I believe was the name of it, L-A-E. And the ship was so large it couldn't get into shore. And uh, they had a floating dock about a mile out in the bay. And uh, they made our company personnel get off on that dock and they loaded us on uh, these uh, army ducks that they used at that time. They had wheels on them and they, would, they could go out in the bay and they could run on land. And uh, I believe there were six or seven of them hold our company. And uh, I thought that thing would sink all the way in. Uh, the spare tire laid on a flat area up on the back. And I sat on that spare tire with my bag. And uh, the uh, hole that the men sat in had a, a sideboard that was about a foot high around the edge of it. And the tire that I set on back on the back, the water was up around it all the time. Uh, they had a uh, about an inch and a half pipe that uh, was a bilge pump out of the bottom of the hold and pump water back out over the side. And uh, You mean that bridge would just go under the water from the weight of this? Well, that, uh, that duck uh, had such a load in it, uh, there was too many men on it, mm -hmm. and uh, it would uh, it would go down in the water far enough that the water would splash into the hold oh. some. And this can, bilge... Can this, you swim? No. Oh. <laughs> this bilge pump was about an inch and a half pipe, and uh, under normal conditions it probably would not pump very much water, and it pumped a full stream of water from the time we left the dock till, we, till after we got up on shore. Oh, yeah. uh, the water was splashing over into the hold some mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. I, that was about the sorriest trip I took on. And when we, the next day, they, our captain went and made a radio call somewhere, and we got back on that same ship the next morning and uh, went back out on those, <laughs> on those ducks back out to that floating dock and got back on the same ship. Uh, and I think the next day was my birthday, the 4th. Well, November. what was the reason to take you on shore at that time? Due to some foul up in orders is all we knew. Because yeah. uh, you didn't do anything particularly. We didn't do anything. We sat under a tree all night and some guys were kind enough to feed us some... We didn't have anything with us, no equipment, no nothing. And uh, it was just a mix up in orders some way or other. And, uh, we 
sat around there and and uh, they fed us some supper and uh, and we slept out there under some trees during the night and and uh, the captain spent all night he got a driver to take him someplace uh, the company had a very good even at that time a very good record of work they'd done and were in good favor with a, a general of the communications in Hawaii and I'm sure that's who he got in touch with because we got back on the same boat the next morning and went on to Calandria. Uh, the, uh, we spent uh, a month at Calandria and uh, left there the 7th of December. Uh, when we got on this, uh, this time we get on a, an old Liberty ship and they they cleared a, uh, a hold area right under the deck so we could set up our cots for, oh, there was probably 130 or so of us, 130 mm -hmm. or 40. And that day there was to be a convoy, that morning there was to be a convoy leave to go to Leyte. Uh, I would say there were probably 30 Liberty ships, and uh, I don't know how many of these destroyer escorts that would go along with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, along with I don't know how many more ships, was laying in that bay the morning of the 7th. And uh, the bay was probably 25 miles across, and the area where it went out into the ocean was not more than two miles, maybe, or three. And that was quite a sight to see maybe 75 vessels laying an anchor out in there before those left. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that that was really something. And I found out in the last three or four years that Arliss Riggs Jr. at Laverne was on one of those uh, Liberty ships in that bay, Humboldt Bay they called it, mm -hmm. the same morning when I left there <laughs> to go to, go to Leyte. Well. Uh, and an occurrence, uh, for some reason or other, the Liberty, the old cargo boat that we loaded on, uh, some problem or other arose and the convoy left early in the morning. And uh, we didn't leave until about noon. And they left one destroyer escort to go with us until we caught up with the convoy. And... Uh, uh, the convoy was supposed to be moving about six knots an hour, and the top speed of a cargo boat, one of those old Liberty ships, was nine knots. So it was two days or so before we caught up with the convoy. And uh, during that time, we just about had a had an accident. Uh, I think probably the second day. Uh, we our vehicles were all on this boat and uh, I was laying on a radio unit up on the top deck reading a book of some kind and I'd look out every little bit at this destroyer escort and uh, they were making this big lazy S back and forth in front of our ship and uh, I'd look at him every once in a while and watch it a little bit and then read a while. And pretty soon I looked up at that thing just at the right time. And uh, the smoke came up out of the exhaust right quick. And uh, they went out around in front of us and came across probably no more than 200 yards across in front of the ship. And uh, turned and dropped out three dynamite barrels down in the ocean and uh, oh my the the water swelled up 10 feet high I suppose and uh, uh, it was a submarine and it was that close and uh, in the past two years I uh, I still am in telephone conversation with the uh, our company commander is Floyd Pratt, and he lives down in Victoria, Texas. 
And uh, I ask him, uh, the, uh, the barrels of dynamite they dropped were set off to go at different depths, and uh, uh, I don't know how deep in the water they were, but uh, uh, I did not learn until the last two years, and I was... Uh, Based in a telephone conversation with the man that was our company commander, uh, Floyd Pratt, and he lives down in Victoria, Texas. And I asked him if they sunk them, and uh, he said they told him they did. And uh, I said, Well, I don't know why I never asked before, but uh, being enlisted personnel, they never told you anything. You didn't know what, what happened there. You, you just knew they scared you to death, and that's. I thought we just about drew the button there, maybe. Uh, but in another day, well, we caught up with the convoy and uh, went on to uh, Leyte. And uh, we just uh, probably were in the bay when they had that uh, uh, Leyte Gulf uh, uh, sea battle that... Uh, that kind of decided who was going to control the area and who wasn't. Uh, it was far away from us and we we don't even know what's going on. But uh, they took us ashore. Uh, there's no there's no dock and uh, they took us ashore on landing craft and uh, we set up pup tents and so forth and uh, and then proceeded, we had to unload, uh, some of the men stayed out on the ship and helped, and uh, a large number of us uh, uh, used uh, construction trucks that we used in our uh, telephone business to set boxes on other trucks on this landing craft. And uh, it took us about a week to get our equipment, and uh, there was a headquarters company that had a lot of equipment on there and all of the paper and all of the smaller things were boxed and and extremely heavy and and we'd pick them up with this winch truck and set them in trucks and uh, I it was I guess 110 degrees uh, there and uh, Leyte is a place that it rains every couple hours or so and uh, the steam comes up out of the jungle after the after the rain passes and oh it's it's sticky and in that ship where we were unloading there's no breeze or anything else and, and uh, uh, boy it sure was a hot season and I don't know how often two or three times a day and sometimes more often uh, one lone Jap plane would come over and, and uh, uh, machine gun the beach right along and and uh, in front of the boat and uh, uh, the side walls of the landing craft were pretty high but uh, usually everybody would lay down someplace when that thing came along and then we just went back to business as usual uh, but it took us about a week to get the, the uh, gear all on shore and uh, we spent about seven or eight months on Leyte, uh, and our line crews had a very busy time of it. Uh, I worked for a, a chap from Tennessee, that uh, Joe Fleming, died about two or three years ago. He was our uh, sergeant, and uh, I had a camp driver's license, and uh, we had a regular driver on our truck, but uh, he was from, had nothing to do with the fact he was from Boston, but he wore glasses terribly thick and he couldn't see anything at night. And uh, we had to make a, we had about 25 miles of open wire and cable to take care of. And uh, on one end was the 8th Army headquarters and uh, numerous uh, units. And at the other end was the uh, 10th Corps, I think it was. And uh, 
they did not want any of that line out of commission more than two hours if it could be avoided. And uh, the sergeant that I worked for was the lowest grade sergeant of the four uh, groups that worked out on the line. And uh, I suppose for a three month period of time, I drove for him at night and helped him and, uh, and we worked in the daytime. And we'd come back in anywhere from midnight till two or three o'clock in the morning and take a shower. And uh, about the time we'd go to bed, they'd have an air raid warning. And we'd get up and go out and sit in the holes for a while. And when it was over, we usually went and ate breakfast and, and went and took the truck and went back out to work. We did not get much sleep for about a three month period of time. Uh, about as hard a period as uh, I remember working. Uh, one incident that took place during that time, uh, there was an air base just about four or five miles from us and uh, our telephone line was not across it. And I don't know why this happened, but a uh, cargo plane came in too low and caught his tail wheel on our telephone line and tore down uh, more than a quarter of a mile of that open wire line about 10 o'clock at night. Did it damage the plane? No, it was able to land and it never bothered it any. Oh, it I did not it. break the lead cable that was there, but it broke all 30 open wires oh. and tore that telephone line down posts and everything, uh, probably more than a quarter of a mile. And uh, we hunted around in our companies, and I think they called some other units, and uh, we got some uh, rubber-covered cable. And uh, they kept bringing it in and bringing it out while we were working out there. And we spliced rubber cable together during the night by flashlights and so forth. And at 4 o'clock the next morning, uh, all of those lines were working but one pair. Hmm. Uh, we went in and ate breakfast and went down and loaded some poles and went back out and put it up <laughs> during the day. That You didn't take the day off because you'd been out all night. They, they just, uh, you just went on after it. You said you went down and ate breakfast. Uh, we went down to our camp and, uh -huh. and uh, got How some. was the food in the Army all this time? Uh, when we were in, when I was in this unit in New Caledonia, the food was very good. And uh, you could tell how long you'd been on an island by how the food was. When you first got there and for a number of months afterward, uh, you ate K-rations. And, uh, and after, what did they compose of? Well, uh, uh, dehydrated foods. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, uh, they came in a, a uh, sealed cardboard box that was uh, waterproofed and everything. And uh, units like ours, I suppose, just hauled them out by the truckload. And uh, we got so that we would, uh, uh, the first thing we ran into with this telephone line that we were keeping care of was that they did not clear a good right of way and the leaves would fall off the coconut trees onto the open wire and ground it out. And uh, so we started taking uh, cutting trees back away from the line. And we found out in this process that the milk from green coconuts is uh, delicious but it is so potent that when you first drink it, the first few times you drink it, it is a laxative, very severe laxative. And uh, we got, so we were tired of the K rations and, and we hauled coconuts around in the truck all the time from the trees that we'd cut down. And uh, the ripe coconuts, we'd pour the milk out on the ground and eat the, uh, meat out of them, the coconuts like you buy here, mm -hmm. and but we cut these green ones off and uh, open them on the end and 
drink the milk out of them. And the meat in them has not formed yet well, and it's just a, a filmy substance. It isn't. To, it isn't good for anything. But the milk was, oh, just sweet and just delicious. But say it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty strong. <laughs> you learned the hard way, did you? <laughs> uh, we liked it after we. Uh, after you get used, used to it, it, it wasn't a laxity then. But. Uh, most of the places that we were on when we first got there, the first few months, why the food would not be, it would just be the K-ration thing. Mm -hmm. Lots of coffee, if you could bear the coffee they had, and, and uh, uh, bread, and, and uh, my wife dearly loves marmalade, and they were sending lots of stuff like that up from Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, you had bread, and marmalade, uh, and they had, I don't know how they took care of it, uh, they had butter. Uh, it's in that climate, uh, boy, it's pretty hard to keep anything very long. Well, it, I don't think. Well, they had to have ice to keep their butter, didn't they? I don't know. It was in, uh, it was sealed in cans, oh, and uh, I don't know how they, uh, how they maintained it at all uh, for a period of time we wouldn't have any uh, ice they made uh, oh they made some lemonade kind of stuff out of this uh, out of uh, dehydrated powder that was in this K rations mm -hmm. and uh, for a time it would just be water and it was terrible and then they'd finally get the uh, opportunity to get ice uh, they brought water to our camps. A uh, truck delivered water every day. And uh, they had devices they called blister bags. They were huge canvas bags. And they were hung on tripods, steel posts. And uh, they had chlorinated that water until it just looked like milk, just about, in order to make it fit to drink. Mm -hmm. uh, all during this time we were there, and before we left New Caledonia, we started taking Adabrin. Yeah. And uh, it had a tendency after a few weeks to turn the pigment of your skin a kind of yellow looking color. Uh, some, some people, it really had, really had a bad effect. Their skin looked very strange. Uh, but it was... Uh, Oh, there. Uh, some of the men's skin took on a uh, complexion that uh, uh, had they had the eyes and everything, they would have looked Chinese. They their skin looked that yellow, uh -huh. odd-looking color. But I don't believe uh, that I knew of any men in the company that had malaria. Uh, uh, we. Uh, waded around out in the swamps and everything else and and what uh, animals were there did you run across any well very few they they had some severe battles in the in some of that area and uh, uh, my friend told me that he killed a couple of snakes that was eight or ten foot long not very far from camp and if I had known they were out wandering around while we were out at night in the swamps I don't know whether they'd have got me to go back or not, <laughs> but uh, I never saw any. Uh -huh. uh, and the uh, Filipino people used uh, the old uh, water buffalo or caribou for their uh, uh, laboring use to uh, farm their patches of rice and such things as that. And you saw yeah. them? You saw them out Yes, there? we saw yeah. them around. I mm -hmm. have some pictures of them oh, yeah. at home. Uh, the other, uh, the other thing that was bothersome uh, that we worried some about, and I don't know if, if anyone ever had a bad effect from that or not, was, uh, I can't give you a technical name, but it was uh, a thing they referred to as blood flukes, and it was a, a type of an insect that uh, was in the swamps and would uh, uh, penetrate your skin and get in your bloodstream and was supposed to uh, cause uh, a liver 
disorder of some kind. And uh, they would always advise us every time we came in to uh, wash our feet and legs and so forth. And uh, we did before very long. They, some of the men managed to get set up and fix a, a, a shower and uh, so forth so we could take showers. But, uh, and I don't know whether uh, I've lost contact with lots of those men, and I have no idea whether anyone ever had any problem with it or not, but uh, uh, they warned us about it. There also was a thing appeared on the bulletin board that they would, uh, the medical area of the armies did not want to be responsible for men that stayed in Leyte more than six months because of the health problems there. And uh, we were there a little longer than that. I don't know just how long. Uh, the first uh, Christmas I spent overseas uh, was there on Leyte, and we were still, we got to Leyte about the 15th of, of uh, December, and we're still living in pup tents. And, and uh, about Christmas, just a day or two before Christmas, we got a load of mail that uh, had been held up someplace. And I remember quite well trying to lay in a pup tent. There'd be two of us in there and there's not room to get in it hardly anyway. And uh, trying to re-look at some Christmas cards by candlelight uh, uh, at night. There was, there was no time in daytime, but uh, wasn't a very uh, happy, thrilling moment in your <laughs> in your lifetime, but uh, probably the most severe duty that we had any time was there on that island. Uh, the hardest work and and under the worst conditions. Uh, I remember a little flat bridge over a little. Uh, uh, area that came back in from the ocean that uh, some fellows told me that it changed hands uh, four or five times when they were in their battles for Leyte. Uh, we would take the little bridge and, and get across it in the daytime and the Japanese would take it back at night and we'd take it back the next day and uh, there was a three or four day period before we finally was able to uh, hold it at night and progress on away from there. But uh, it was quite a, uh, uh, they had a gasoline dump at that, uh, near that airport and uh, they uh, filled barrels with gas out in the bay and since they didn't have a port or, or uh, docks they threw them out in the ocean and they just floated in with the tide and then they'd pick them out and stack them up. And uh, quite a large number of barrels in a few acres of area there and, and they, uh, the Japanese hit one side of it with uh, bombs. And uh, it seems to me like it took about five minutes for a barrel to get hot enough to explode and it would burn and, and uh, in about another five minutes, another barrel would explode and the gasoline would burn. And uh, they moved the barrels away as close as they could get so that it didn't just destroy the whole area. But uh, it burned for quite a while, uh, a few days and nights. Uh, you could hear those things blowing off. Uh, I think it was three or four miles away, but uh, it it was a day and night thing going on until it burned itself out finally. Mm -hmm. And we left, uh, uh, we moved in one camp area and lived there about three or four months and then we moved up uh, in a camp area just uh, uh, at the edge of Tacloban, that's the capital of Leyte, and uh, stayed there until we left. And uh, during that period of time, uh, we uh, had been driving on the left side of the road, like they do in England and European countries. 
and uh, someone that thought they were a genius and, and had uh, uh, enough uh, rating to back it up decided at midnight one night they would change the uh, the traffic to the right side of the road and uh, the next couple of weeks was rather interesting because it uh, it was terribly hard to uh, go over the same roads you'd been going on and drive on the opposite side of the road where you'd been driving. I was driving all the time for a, a uh, another sergeant then and uh, say that was uh, I guess all you could say was interesting. Uh, there was a, a lot of near accidents and I guess the, the, they tried to keep the speed limit at 25 mile an hour and army vehicles being as heavy as they were and everything I don't suppose anybody got got damaged but uh, I'm sure there were some accidents because that, that really uh, that oh, was a mess. Not everybody then was driving on the right hand side? Everyone changed to the right side of the road. They One night at midnight it went into effect and the road you drove on the left side the day before you changed and drove on the right side the next day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was... Uh, <laughs> what was the purpose of changing? I have no idea. Uh, they just... Uh, Maybe they thought that side had been, had, uh, oh, what do you call them, bombs? No, uh, it had it had something to do with the idea they felt that uh, uh, since we were used to in, in the United States driving on the right hand side of the road, why they they just well there were uh, the mayor of Tacloban had a forty one Chevrolet car that they had hidden all during the occupation of the Japanese, and they got it out and they used it. And as far as I know, that was the only uh, vehicle that we ever saw. Well, that was a native mm -hmm. car. Yeah. Uh, the, I don't know why they changed. Uh, I don't even know why they started driving on the left-hand side when they got there. It mm -hmm. would have been simple to have changed it then. Mm -hmm. But after everyone's used to driving on the left side and then changed, oh, it was a mess for a while. Okay, we, and where did you go next? Uh, or we left... Uh, uh, I think probably in July, uh, we loaded all of our trucks and all of our men and equipment, and uh, and there was another unit or so besides us, and we loaded on an LST and uh, went from Leyte around, and we were on that vessel uh, a week, mm -hmm. and we went to uh, Manila, and... Uh, unloaded at Manila. Uh, the uh, war had not, I don't know how long it had been since they'd got things kind of cleared up, but uh, I read here in later years that uh, they attempted to get the Japanese to give up Manila without a uh, artillery battle or anything, and they refused. And uh, when we landed, they had taken bulldozers and uh, Manila was quite a modern city in 1940. Mm -hmm. And they had taken bulldozers and gone along and shoved the brick and the rubble out of the streets uh, to attempt to get some area so that they could pass through with trucks. And, and that's what we drove through in a convoy. And we went out about 60 miles to a camp area that was about 10 or 12 miles from Clark Field that we still use as an air base. Mm -hmm. And uh, our duties were not too well established there and the uh, the line crew that I worked in uh, went up in the uh, mountains between uh, the camp area there and uh, Subic Bay and cut trees for telephone poles. And we spent a good bit of time up there cutting those trees down and making telephone poles out of them, hauled them back down to the camp area where we lived. And during that time, there was about 20 of us probably that uh, uh, got our meals and stayed in some tents with the Navy Seabees at uh, Subic Bay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, Did you run across anybody in the CBs that you knew? I never saw a soul from the time I left home until I got back that I had ever known before I went to the Army. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a lot of wonderful friends, but I never saw anyone <laughs> from home. And uh, during this time, uh, we uh, went up to Clark Field one day and took all of our trucks and vehicles and all. Uh, I had a three-quarter ton weapons carrier assigned to me. We drew all new vehicles. And uh, a short time after that, we uh, had the privilege, if we wanted to do it, to buy uh, some uh, Japanese invasion money. Uh, it's uh, military currency is what it says on it. I've still got some of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we found out what date we would invade Japan. Uh, the, the original intent was for the first troops to land the 1st of November and our company was supposed to land the 4th of November, which was interesting to me because it was on my birthday. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking forward to it. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't think so. And uh, during the time that uh, we were cutting poles, a few, a little bit long later, we were over at Subic Bay and one of the fellows had a radio or it was in the next tent or something. And uh, it came over the radio that they had dropped an atomic bomb on Japan. Told the city and everything. And we look at each other, and we don't know what an atomic bomb is, had no idea in the world. But uh, they said that it had done a lot of terrible destruction, and they had asked the Japanese for peace terms, unconditional peace terms. And they refused. And uh, just in a three or four day period or something, and they couldn't get anything from them, I guess, they dropped the second atomic bomb, and uh, so I don't know what time of day this thing occurred or anything. We were out working all day and then come in at night, but we'd hear it on the radio at night. And uh, after the second one, why well, they agreed to peace terms, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it was before the 1st of November, uh, we loaded our company on, uh, I believe it took seven of those uh, LCTs, landing craft tank. I think there were seven of them, and we loaded on those down at Manila and spent seven days on those things and uh, landed at uh, Yokohama. And uh, that was an interesting ride also. Uh, the old Liberty ship that we rode on from New Guinea up to the up to Leyte would take spasms of rolling from side to side till you'd nearly have to crawl. You couldn't hardly stand up. Uh, I was going to ask you, who, what is a Liberty? Well, a Liberty ship was made by the Kaiser Company, uh, the Kaiser outfit in uh, Washington, uh, and it's just a cargo boat. Oh. He, mm -hmm. he made hundreds of them, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they would, uh, uh, somehow the way their load was on them or something or other, they would take spells and for hours and hours they'd just roll from side to side till you couldn't even walk on them hardly. You just have to run from grab from one thing to another to keep your feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, these landing craft was a flat bottomed uh, vessel designed to run up on the beach and let the door down mm -hmm. and land tanks and trucks and things. And uh, when you when we came out of uh, Manila Bay, the water wasn't very rough, but uh, uh, this little thing would uh, raise up on the front on a little old wave and when it got past its balance point 
it would come down and hit the water and the back end would raise up then and it would just shiver all over like a like a leaf on a tree and uh, there was a Wait, no go ahead there was around 40 or so men on each one mm -hmm. and uh, uh, another fellow and I, there was not room for us all to stay in their uh, quarters, and I had the weapons carrier pickup assigned to me, so I just laid a mattress out in the seat, and that's where I lived on the trip up there. And uh, in Manila Bay, the, another fellow laid on the hood and and slept, and I stayed in there, and this, this uh, truck happened to be just about in the middle of the vessel. He and I were the only ones on the boat that didn't get sick. Well, wow. uh, there, there's something else that's unique about the landing craft that we discovered when we were unloading that one at Leyte. Uh, when they came ashore, they came uh, with what speed they had to get their their front up on the dirt aways, so the trucks could get off. Well, then when they unloaded, it becomes a problem to get off of the ground. Well, they figured out how to solve that. They had a pretty good size anchor, and out about 100 yards bef from the shore, uh, oh, farther than that, probably two or three. They would drop that anchor two or three hundred yards out in the bay and uh, come on ashore just as hard as they could. And when they got unloaded, uh, they of course could reverse their propellers to pull themselves back. But they would start reeling in that anchor and uh, it's a pretty good sized job and it's down in the sand underneath. And just pull themselves off of the beach and... Uh, go back out to the ship uh, and pick up another load. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a means of getting themselves loose from the beach and it, it worked very nicely. Mm -hmm. But we uh, left Manila uh, in October sometime, I think, and uh, went up to Manila, up to, uh, uh, oh, what town did I say a while ago? Yokohama, mm -hmm. Japan, and uh, came in Tokyo Bay and uh, Tokyo and, and Yokohama, and there may be another city or so. Uh, Tokyo Bay is large enough that those cities are all on in that uh, bay area. And uh, our captain had gone up previously on a plane and found a place for us, our company, to live in. And uh, the... Uh, night just before dark or about dark that we landed it was raining and pouring down and blowing and uh, and cold to us because we'd been down on the islands a long time and uh, we drove a few miles in a convoy one vehicle right after another and came to this building about a four or five story building and it had been the YMCA building and he had uh, gotten permission for our company to live in that building. And uh, there was some stuff that had to be unloaded by hand off of those uh, landing craft. And some way or other, I did not draw that duty. And, uh, and uh, But a number of fellows was working on it. And it was blowing and raining in the night. And, and uh, the vehicle I had was a, uh, I said, a weapons carrier, and it had a winch on the front. And uh, the uh, company motor pool man had fixed a device to make an A-frame on the front of it with a cable down to the back end so that you could pick up boxes and things. And uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody woke me up and... and uh, said we got some boxes and things and trucks that we can't unload and uh, would you come down and, and uh, help us unload this stuff and uh, a company like ours you 
we were all in it together and you didn't refuse anyone. And I went down there and spent the rest of the time until daylight, sitting in the truck in the cold rain, unloading boxes. And uh, uh, we uh, found out in a, in a week or two that uh, they'd had a terrible typhoon off of Okinawa. Uh, in fact, it sank vessels, I believe, they said as large as a cruiser or something. And it went through the area that we had just passed through two or three days before in those little landing craft. Uh, another time we escaped with the skin of our teeth. If we'd have been three or four days later, we wouldn't have made it. Because uh, there was uh, some large vessels that sunk in that storm. We felt like we probably lost some of our mail in some of those cargo vessels that went down in that storm. And we spent, uh, uh, we put in some switchboards and, and uh, in some hospitals and, and uh, uh, some of the men were beginning to go home on point system things and, and uh, I had not been overseas uh, by October of 45. Some of those men of our company had been over there three years and uh, they were going home of course and uh, they progressed along to us and and uh, I left, uh, went to a replacement depot in January and uh, came back, uh, oh, on another troop ship and uh, uh, I have a picture of it at home but I can't remember what the name of it was. Uh, it took about 17 days to get from uh, Yokohama to San Francisco. Mm -hmm came in under the Golden Gate Bridge and walked across the dock and got on the same little old excursion boat that we loaded on almost two years before and went back up to Camp Stoneman and uh, they processed us there a little bit and, and loaded a large number of us on a, a troop train and we came across country to uh, Leavenworth and uh, was discharged there, and I got home on the 4th of February of 1946. While you were in Japan, did you make any uh, sightseeing trips? Yes, uh, one, one venture we made, uh, I have some pictures uh, of this uh, uh, Garden of the Gods and this bronze Buddha that was in your geography books when you went to school. Uh, I have some pictures of uh, myself you... taken in front of it. And, oh, and, I wish uh, you'd have brought them. There's a, uh, a ladder around behind up inside of it that you could climb up in it. Uh, we went up to, uh, uh, was going to go to Mount Fujiyama. It was one Sunday and I had a vehicle assigned to me and uh, I think there was four of us and we took some rations along and we were going to go up to see uh, that Mount Fujiyama. Uh, oftentimes on clear days we could see it from down there. It shows up quite obvious from Tokyo and Yokohama if the weather's clear. Mm -hmm. And we got within about five miles of it and uh, we were in the 8th Army uh, under their command and they stopped us there in a road and uh, on the other side was the 6th Army area and we did not have passes to get into the 6th Army area so we couldn't go on up there. Well. And uh, that's as close as we got to it. But mm -hmm. we did some traveling around a little in the day and, and uh, took some pictures and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, How that, did the Japanese treat you? Very well. Uh, I, I think probably most of the people that we came in contact with were, were uh, women and children or very old people. And uh, they, uh, uh, Yokohama and Tokyo have both been firebombed terribly. And there's just one or two buildings in each block standing in it, and it's concrete or some some type of thing like that or it's all torn down and wrecked. 
and there's no place for them to stay and there isn't any food. They line up three times a day and uh, just dip whatever we threw out of our mess cans, out of the, out of the trash cans, and ate whatever it was. Mm. And uh, I attempted to take some pictures of them when they're standing in line. They're not very good. But I have some pictures I took from the top of the building of them standing. Well, there'd be 30 or 40 of them. Yeah. Uh, all my life, I'd been taught not to leave anything in my plate, you know, mm -hmm. as a boy growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, not very long watching that, we got so we'd leave, we'd get more food than we ate and, and take it out there and give it to them. I know everybody did it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I sure did. I felt sorry for them. Mm -hmm. And that was that first winter was undoubtedly terrible for them because uh, they just, they were roaming the streets all the time and in no place to they had been firebombed and torn down no not much they began to put up tents for them and everything like that but uh, I that first winter of forty five and forty six was was terrible for them I'm sure. I uh, spent another Christmas there, 1945. How was it? Well, it was more enjoyable because I knew in a few, in a matter of two, three weeks, I was going home. I had points enough <laughs> that I was, was finally going to get to go home. Uh, and, of course, a lot of the men that you'd become good friends with uh, had already left. Mm -hmm. uh, there was new ones that had come in the company that hadn't been in so long. Mm -hmm. But our company was beginning, it was strictly a wartime unit, and uh, they were in the business of uh, closing that unit down. Uh, there were probably less than 50 fellows, and most of them were working in the office trying to get uh, records and everything closed up. Did you ever go downtown in either one of those cities? Well, I worked and I didn't at night or anything. You didn't uh, at night? No. Uh, I went over, I delivered a uh, switchboard unit to the 1st Cavalry Division and they were stationed in the, uh, it had been what they call the West Point of Japan, uh, over by Tokyo, a few miles out the edge of Tokyo, and I delivered a unit over there and stayed a couple of days. And we installed a... Uh, a two-place, uh, a two-person switchboard and all the telephone lines and everything in a uh, large hospital building. It had been a Japanese hospital and they had torn the wiring all out of it when they had to turn it over and we had to, and we worked over there for more than a month maybe uh, mm -hmm. on that and drove back and forth every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and after the after they, uh, after it was finished, why uh, they would call over to our company, and and uh, I became the only uh, fellow that was left that was doing installation and line work, and had a couple of fellows uh, working under me that didn't <laughs> hadn't been in the company very long and didn't know much about this thing, and they would call over there to ask to get another telephone put in someplace, and we'd go over there and and. Uh, put in a telephone and I'd wire the uh, switchboard and frame and uh, get it fixed up. And, uh, there was another hospital or two that we uh, took care of the same way and some engineering companies and mm -hmm. so forth that we uh, would go out and uh, and put in more telephones for. We had already installed switchboards and, and some telephones but they would want additional phones. And, mm -hmm we'd go out and do that work. Um, um, did you associate much with the Japanese not in any very, way? Not very much. Uh, I just, uh, I suppose now I'd have been more interested in trying to talk to them and so forth, but I, at the time I just didn't, and I really did not have that uh, uh, ill feeling about them because I had not been in a, in a frontline combat situation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, for a long period of time, uh, in Leyte and, 
and uh, after we moved to Luzon, we would hear this uh, Tokyo Rose on our radios a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, the music was all right, but uh, I don't know whether anybody believed the message much that they tried to pass off to us or not. Uh, we had a, uh, in Leyte, we had a uh, earth tremor one night during the night, and uh, that's the first occasion I ever was around anything like that. It's similar to an earthquake, mm -hmm. and uh, it shook the cots in the in the tents and uh, the uh, coconuts in the trees. You could hear them dropping out. It's the middle of the night. You could hear them banging on the ground, and hear the leaves shaking in the trees. It it shook things pretty good. Gave you an eerie feeling. Didn't yes. It? And uh, one of the messages that uh, Tokyo Rose kept passing on down there was that uh, they uh, warned them not to uh, not to bomb uh, that uh, Mount Fujiyama or anything up there because all those islands down in that area were they thought were chain islands and would just disappear and sink if they bombed that. I guess no one believed that really, but uh, uh, it come over the radio once in a while. What is that, a volcano? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's not active mm -hmm. now, but uh, every once in a while it steams off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I got back to Shattuck at, on the 4th of February and stepped off the train down there. and you know what happens out here in February sometimes. The wind's blow until you could hardly stand up outside. And uh, the folks were there, of course, waiting for me. And I think they may have met two or three trains. I don't really know because I had no idea when I was going to get... Mm -hmm. But I couldn't help but notice the wind blowing. I'm just blowing up pretty good. Yes. And... Uh, I hadn't been around where the wind blew much unless it was a typhoon or something going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't help but uh, help but notice that wind coming through the area. I guess it seemed like home when that wind hit you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, what did you do? Come home and rest a while? Or what did you do then? Well, I... Uh, uh, didn't have uh, anything to do much except uh, uh, help my dad. Uh, uh, in 1946, and shortly after I got home, he was 66 years old, and he wanted to quit farming. He'd been having a heck of a time trying to get anything done, and in fact had rented his wheat land to my brother-in-law the year before. And. Uh, I really, there really wasn't much to do but help him take care of stock and so forth. And, and I worked in harvest for my brother-in-law. And, and uh, I had a little money saved up. And uh, my father sold me as he had a Model A John Deere tractor, a 42 model, and, and a plow and a, and a drill and, and a pickup. And, and he sold the stuff, the articles to me for fifteen hundred dollars, which is about all the money I had. And uh, uh, after harvest that year, why, well, uh, I, with his help, why well, I started in to farm to put out the first crop of wheat. The first crop I uh, had, why, well, uh, uh, we had to go in on a half basis because, oh, I suppose he'd have done some other way with me, but uh, that's what we decided to do. I didn't have enough money to buy wheat seed and all that kind of thing. And uh, the sad part of it was that he even had to pay for some of the gas because I didn't have enough money to buy enough gas to farm the land hardly. But what did you make a month when you were in the Army? Well, when I went in, uh, in the States, as a private, I got $50 a month. And uh, when I went overseas as a private, I got $64 a month. No, $60 a month. And uh, a, a strange thing occurred after we got up to Leyte. Uh, they passed uh, our 
our federal government the legislature passed a bill that uh, allowed everyone to be a PFC after they'd been overseas six months. And uh, the joke about that was that uh, the guys would tell each other, I got my PFC stripes by uh, order of Congress. Made quite a ja joke out of that thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, then your uh, uh, monthly salary was $64.80, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I was in Japan a while, I got to be a uh, uh, technician, fifth grade, uh, it's the same as a corporal. And uh, it seems to me like that uh, it was uh, 75 or $80 a month. Uh, you drew 20% above your base pay because you were overseas. Mm -hmm. And then about another month, I uh, was uh, increased in grade to a T4, which is equal to a sergeant rating. And uh, I don't remember, it seems to me like it was uh, around 90 or $100 a month, something like that, and, uh, 105 or something. I don't remember exactly now. What it was. Oh, they furnished your clothing, didn't they? Yes. Uh, any clothing that wore out or fell to pieces or rotted, why they <laughs> replaced it. Mm -hmm. uh, the officers now had to buy their clothing. Oh, they did? Yes. Uh, but they were paid bigger wages. Yes, uh, they were, but uh, a second lieutenant probably was the poorest paid fellow on earth. Uh, the uh, enlisted men bid him from the lower grades and the officers was all above him and bid him from the top. <laughs> and he had to buy his own clothes and be chewed on by everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, the men like uh, master sergeants and first sergeants and, and in that area, uh, they drew pretty good wages at those times and their clothing was furnished and all this kind of thing. Uh, but they I, had to go through this uh, second lieutenant. No, uh, no, you just went through the supply. Uh, oh. uh, if you just had, if you had an article that was worn or something rather like that or torn or something or mm -hmm. otherwise, your supply sergeant, you'd just take it in and, and uh, give it to him and he'd give you another one. Mm -hmm. Hopefully some size that would fit you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And where did you meet your wife? Let's get back home now. Uh, she was working in uh, a, a cafe in Laverne, and uh, in my running around efforts and going to movies and so forth, I got acquainted with her. Uh, do you folks remember the Jay's Cafe that used to be on a block south of the light in Laverne on the east side of the street there right after the war for two, three years? A uh, man built a uh, restaurant and a uh, dry cleaning establishment there. I remember it, but... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. The buildings are still there, and mm -hmm. she was working in that restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, she grew up uh, about seven or eight miles northeast of Laverne. Mm -hmm. uh, her father was Clark Hicks, and Myrtle Hicks was her mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had been in the wax for... Uh, I believe 33 months or something like that. Well, I should interview her. Uh, she is the only uh, uh, WAC personnel in Harper County, I think. Oh, is that right? Uh, Winnie Hart was in the uh, uh, Army Nurse Corps mm -hmm. and was overseas some. and uh, But uh, I think uh, Nellie enlisted in the, well, and spent uh, that period of time. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything that she told you about her? Oh, she she did a, a number. They had a, a short basic training thing, and uh, then she started. Uh, I believe about the next thing she did was uh, she drove for uh, officers. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, one of the camp commanders and one of the 
camp she stayed, she drove for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last month that she was in, she worked in the medical supply area. Uh, she when at? she got back, she had uh, the same rating that I had, a technician for uh, rating. Mm -hmm. She, that's, that is uh, in a way admirable, I guess. Uh, uh, where they lived out there, there was no school bus at the time, and she just had an eighth grade education. And uh, uh, some of them, they gave them a test when they went in, just like they did us. Mm -hmm. Only they were enlisting, and if they didn't make high enough on the test, they wouldn't accept them. And uh, some of them were turned down. And she always felt real, real good that she just had an eighth grade education, and yet she was easily able to pass the test. And yes, that, that was marvelous. Oh. Was she on the front lines then? No, she never was out of this country. Oh, she wasn't? No. She uh, was at Fort Oglethorpe and, and uh, oh, let's see, she told me some other places. Uh, we thought we'd like to go down there and, and uh, try to see some of the country at the two or three camps where she stayed. Mm -hmm. and we haven't got it done yet. Mm -hmm. Let's see, have you told me your marriage date when you got married? Uh, I probably don't know. Oh. Uh, I believe it was August the 21st of 1947. And uh, our uh, children were born, uh, uh, the older boy was born uh, uh, the last, I think, the 30th or 29th of June of 1948, mm -hmm. and uh, right in harvest. Mm -hmm. And the younger boy was born uh, April the 6th, I think it is, of 1950. You're a typical dad. <laughs> um, the older boy lives in uh, Edmond, and uh, they both have a college degree and uh, his is in accounting and he is an accountant for a oil company in Oklahoma City and uh, the younger boy got a business major degree and could not find a job anywhere and, and finally uh, wandered out to Oregon and just worked at one thing and another and uh, they were both good math students and uh, he always was interested in uh, small engines and, and technical things. He liked to tinker with things. And he uh, tutored math students and uh, put himself through uh, electronic school out there. And uh, he is a television repairman. Oh, yeah. And lives in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. You didn't give me your boy's first names. Uh, the oldest boy's name is uh, Robert L. Baker, mm -hmm. Bob. Mm -hmm. And uh, the youngest boy's name is uh, Max Raymond Baker. And, and the reason for such simple names is that uh, my dad had trouble pronouncing uh, my sister's girl's name. And uh, Mom asked Nellie if we couldn't make a name or a boy some simple kind of thing that Dad could pronounce all right. So they're Bob and Max. <laughs> Well, those are good names. <laughs> <laughs> and how much land do you farm out there uh, where you live? Uh, in Harper and Ellis County, both, uh, I uh, own a thousand acres of land. Mm -hmm. And uh, I rent uh, 320 acres of land in Ellis County, mm -hmm. all farmland. Mm -hmm. Keeps you busy. Yes. Uh, I do practically all the farming and uh, and cattle thing myself uh, I uh, since the boys left well, I have uh, some help in harvest but as far as the uh, farming and wheat sowing and all that kind of thing why well, I, I do about all of it myself I have a, a good friend uh, uh, name of Avery Stinson Jr. that uh, he and I exchange work and have for years uh, with cattle and and 
in an emergency with fence fixing and, and hauling hay and fixing wells and mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. I, I don't know what I'd do without him, and I hope he feels the same way. <laughs> he probably does. Well, I have enjoyed this very much. Can you think of any other one thing that we should talk about? We've got just about three minutes left. <laughs> well, we had some reunions of our company in oh, Chicago yes. uh, in 1968 and in 1970 and 1972. Uh-huh. And uh, they, they planned on continuing, but it fell to pieces and they didn't keep on with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, getting to see some of those fellows that uh, I'd worked with. Uh, I made a trip back to, uh, or our family did, uh, wife and her sister, and made a trip back to uh, South Carolina and down to uh, Birmingham in 1975, and I had a nice visit with uh, the sergeant that I worked day and night with uh, in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has since died. Uh, he had heart problems. and had heart surgery and and he has died. Uh, I keep in touch once in a while uh, by telephone with the man that was our company commander and uh, we have some good visits. Uh, The fellow that was my closest friend was uh, 11 years older than I that was in the company and uh, he died about three years ago in October do you regret your service? In oh, my land, no. Uh, well, I suppose as old as my father was that uh, if I'd have, if we'd have just got honorary about it, I probably would not have had to go. Mm-hmm. Because in, in 43, when I went to the service, he was 63 years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had 560 acres of land out there and was farming fair-sized. Mm-hmm. But we never did discuss whether I... What would or wouldn't it was just when I mm-hmm. I felt like I mm-hmm. wanted to and and it was necessary. And uh, you weren't on the front lines any time. No. You weren't in too much danger. No, no. But yet your service was uh, important to the Not, army. Uh, while we were cutting uh, trees for poles in the hills there in uh, in uh, Luzon there by. Uh, all that uh, CB base uh, there were some Japanese single persons wandering around out there and, and they'd shoot